Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. Check, check, microphone, microphone, check. Testing, one, two, three, testing. Okay, so what have I got? I've got the microphone running, I've got the camera running, I'm live. Right on, right on. So now we'll just wait a moment and we will see, I'll call up the actual YouTube channel to see what the stream looks like live and we can actually begin uh, with this unboxing. Okay, probably do not want to have the uh, sound running at the same time. Uh, 12 watching already, right on. So everybody that's joining us, thank you very much for coming to the stream. What I'm going to try to do is, um, the la one of the earlier streams we had, uh, somebody recommend I buy this book, The Physics of from Physics from Symmetry by Jacob Switzenberg. And it just arrived today. Um, oh, Leo, you you know about this. Were you were you here, Leo, when uh, somebody recommended this book? I've never looked at it, so I'm gonna kind of do this unboxing, right? You know how on YouTube people like to do unboxings. Well, I thought I would do an unbooking, right? We're going to open this book, and we are going to uh, kind of start thumbing through it. I'm pretty excited. It's a beautiful book, first of all. I should say, you know, here is the actual book itself. It's a Spring Springer book. It's actually really big. You know, you can't really tell how big the books are from their Amazon profile, but I'm having trouble with getting this camera close enough. So, well, the camera, if, if it's far enough away to see the whole page, you can't, uh, it doesn't focus very well. Even here, it's still not focusing that well. It's got to be pretty darn close to get it focusing. This may not be the best way to thumb through a book live on YouTube. I'm just, I'm really winging it here. But I was so excited about the book that I wanted to uh, give it a try. So um, why don't we, uh, why don't we do a little unbooking here, the physics from symmetry, right? So the first thing, it's, it's from a series called The Undergraduate undergraduate lecture notes in physics, right? And this is actually quite a large series. And when I hunted down for this book, I realized they had this whole series. And some of them look really fun. Some of them look really good. So uh, this one, however, is uh, the one that was recommended. So the paper is beautiful. The paper is very, very, uh, um, very smooth. It's a really, uh, for the money, this is actually a really good book. Usually Schwinger is really expensive, but, um, but uh, but this wasn't crazy expensive actually. I think I think the full price was like in the 30s, right? Thirty dollars. So I didn't have to spend a lot of money. But as you can see, the the problem is is to get this in focus, right? This is just an inch farther, and the camera won't focus. So let me let me find something to boost this up. Uh, it's it's ironic. I'm stacking books on top of other books to get this close enough to the camera. So let me do that. Uh, let's see, here we go. I'm not going to actually review the book, Helix. I don't think that a book review is what I'm all about because a book review has to have some sort of intent behind it. Like, you know, if you're going to use this book to teach undergraduates, you know, and, and I'm not putting that kind of thought to it. The kind of thought is, is do I like it? I, well, I guess there is some review, right? There's, there's no way to get past that fact. But let's... Uh, Let's just kind of see what this preface starts saying. I like the preface because it always talks about um, the writer. One thing I really like is look at the way this book's laid out. See these marginal notes? I, I think marginal notes in textbooks is terrific. The problem is, is I'm surprised to see them because if you look at all of the wasted space on the page, the amount of material on the page, the proportion is really, it's, it may be 25% of the page is actual text. And I'm really surprised they got away with this. I'm surprised the publisher was so darn inefficient. On the other hand, it looks really good. And I, um, although it's funny, the, 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 the marginal notes chosen here are simply um, references to books. 
that seems like a, a, a waste of the good margin right now. It's not like you have to throw things in the margin. And if you're going to leave so much space in the margin, you might as well not waste the space down below. So I can understand. But these margins usually are used for side thoughts that um, uh, uh, that 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 illuminate the text, but are tangential in some way. So let's see. Um, in the two years since the first edition of this book, I received numerous messages from around the world. How positive most of the people liked it. Yeah, so I, I think this idea of, of a new I approach to this is, is pretty cool. Um, uh, so, um, so let's see. The uh, Anybody who, who whose research requires sustained use of group theory, and it's hard to think of a physical and mathematical problem that is wholly devoid of symmetry, writes a book about it. <laughs> it is true. Even I did that, right? Even I wrote a book essentially that had group theory topics just and focused on it a lot. So apparently he's just all very excited about this. He's thanking everybody. The preface to the first edition, every time you have a quote by Einstein, you always read it. I always worry about some of these quotes are apocryphal, but this one, the most incomprehensible thing about the world is that it's comprehensible. This is just another way of saying the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics, right? Um, oh, interesting. He, here, see, already the marginal quotes are being good. Here he's validating the quote, uh, although he's just referencing another person who's not Einstein, so <laughs> we still don't really know. But um, yeah, look at how absurd this is, right? You get a footnote here, and the actual note is expressed over here, although you can't see it, but that's a little four, right? So you might as well, you have the four and then the four right there. That's sort of the absurd thing of using the footnote, of using the column for footnotes. Um, so, all right, skip the prefaces. I'm not going to read the prefaces. Let's go right into the table of contents. Acknowledgements. You see, I don't read those unless my name is in there, and it never is. All right, so let's see. The first section in this book is going to be called Foundations. What we cannot derive. Book, oh, that's, that sounds like a nice introduction. What we don't know. Um, uh, my book, uh, um, for those of you who have it, the one that's about particle theory and gauge theory, um, is uh, uh, it, it really does talk about all the things we don't really understand very well and the uh, sort of the ad hoc nature of the standard model. So I like that theory. Elementary Particles and Fundamental Forces. Okay, so this is an undergraduate book about symmetry, but right away in the beginning, he jumps into elementary particles and fundamental forces. So we're not going to see a lot of symmetry theory applied to moving blocks and the simple harmonic oscillator on a spring. This is definitely not an introductory level physics book. Its first section is special relativity. And Obviously, right there, the symmetry that they're interested in will be these Lorentz transformations. And uh, ultimately, it ends with the notion of covariance, which should, which is, and, once, and this is sort of the foundation of the work for general relativity, which I imagine will be in here. So then this, that's the first part. The first part is 21 pages, and it gets through special relativity. So it'll be interesting to see um, what his choices are of topics in, in special relativity. Then we get to part two, symmetry tools. All right, so what's going on there? Well, obviously, we're going to have to review groups. So this is valuable to us because we are doing a lesson in Lie group theories, uh, uh, Lie group theory, or, or the theory of Lie groups and Lie uh, algebras. So it's fun to see how an elementary review of this is constructed by this particular author. Um, uh, obviously, you've got to start with the idea of groups, so he's going to introduce that. This, see, this is typically the kind of problem I always experience in physics books. You have a little section called groups, and if you notice, it's going to be three pages long. So it's really interesting to me to see what he... if. If he's imagining an undergraduate's rolling into this course and they're going to study Lie groups and he's not quite sure whether or not they know anything about groups themselves, right? So he's going to have to nail down the concepts of groups in a pretty solid way in three pages. 
And I don't even need to look at that section to tell you it's inadequate, right? On the other hand, his whole program is somewhat ambitious, right? He's trying to take an undergraduate and jump him into Lee Group Theory. Probably, I'm counting on this being a senior level undergraduate piece of work, right? Um, but uh, whatever, right? I mean, I, I'm sure, I, I'm, I don't mean to be critical, right? I'm just saying, this is sort of the problem that led me to do my lectures is like, okay, let's just run topology to ground. And in the Lee Groups lectures, I kind of assumed everybody knew everything about Lee Groups, but now I'm actually backtracking a little bit and I'm going to prepare a series of lectures reviewing fundamental finite group theories, some elements that are important for Lee Groups. And so it'll be interesting to see that. Rotations in two dimensions, rotations with complex numbers, quaternions. This is actually surprisingly practical, rotations with quaternions. A lot of computer programs are using quaternions. If, ever, if anybody here programs games at all, there's a most of the game, computer game development engines like uh, Unreal Engine and like um, uh, 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 Unity, they use quaternions to describe rotations. Um, and most programmers don't really get to the bottom of it, but they learn how to sort of do it by rote, so that's cool. And then they talk about Lie algebras. Well, you know, that'll be interesting. And representation theory, which is the topic we're going to cover next in our Lie group sequence. And then after he kind of nails down these ideas, he leans into the SU2, which is a great place to start. SU2 is a critical group that understanding that group will lead to only good things. Let's see if I can make this paper work uh, like this then. Representation of SU2 in one dimension, two, and three dimensions. Um, yes, yeah, so the idea that every Lie group has multiple representations, an infinite number, in fact. Then the Lorentz group is the next group he talks. Now, th those, of course, are these, these are truly the most two most important groups to physics. L the Lorentz group is what really drives all of particle physics. So What's really important here is you can kind of see where this is going. You know, he's going to talk about these key representations, the zero zeros, one half, zero, zero, one half. And then boom, page 75, he's right into van der Weyden notation, right? That's uh, section 3.77. Really good idea. Uh, you've got to know. So the van der Weyden notation is all about distinguishing between the one zero and the zero one, one half, zero and zero, one half representation of the Lorentz group. That's the whole point of it. And so uh, that's totally cool that uh, he feels the need to get into that. If he's going to get into the van der Weyden notation, it'll be interesting to see how he plans to use it. But um, uh, anyway, going on, spinners and parity, spinners and charge conjugation, infinite dimensional representations, and then elementary particles. And that, of course, is probably what he's trying to get to. He's probably trying to get to the link between elementary particles and representations of the Lorentz group because that ties in with Einstein's statement. Isn't it kind of weird how math kind of explains the universe? And the theory, of course, is that each particle is actually attached to something as abstract as a group representation. All right, so that is his introduction basically to Lie groups and Lie group theory. So, so using that, he now feels comfortable to do a section of work on the framework um, let's see, the, the framework he calls it, Lagrangian formalism, Fermat, Fermat's principle, variational calculus, can't do field, th field theory without it, right? This is all setting you up for field theory, particle theories versus field theories, Nether's theorem, right? So that is the framework. Basically, the Lagrangian formalism to create Lagrangians, um, that's how you're going to uh, then assert things like gauge invariance, and create new Lagrangians that are gauge invariant, and that's going to create the standard model. If you want to know about that, uh, I wrote a really, really nice, I'm, I'm very proud of the small book I wrote on that subject uh, that you can get on the Patreon page. Then we land in part three, the equations of nature. And now all of a sudden he's talking about quantum mechanics, the operators of quantum mechanics, which can be interpreted as symmetries, right? Uh, operators of quantum field theory, free theory. So the free theory is basically a, a great, you know, it's a, 
it's the, the place you start because the free theory is basically each of these particle fields that do not interact with each other. So it's just the fundamental particles themselves. Uh, they have a section on the Proca equation. It's not typical. I mean, it seems that seems like pretty advanced stuff. I'm interested to get in here and see how uh, how he approaches that. Um, Let's see, then interaction theory. So, you know, it looks to me like if, if he's serious about interaction theory, um, uh, well, you know, he may best just be talking about Lagrangians and the interactions of Lagrangians and how to interpret the terms in the Lagrangian. It does not seem to me, because it goes from 131 to 174, it doesn't seem to me like there's going to be calculations of Feynman diagrams, which would truly be an introduction to quantum field theory, right? But that's because this is still the theoretical part. This part three is called the equation of nature. Part two was called symmetry tools. So foundations, symmetry tools, the equations of nature. So you're using the tools to apply the equations of nature. And now it's applications. Where's my section on applications? So presumably now is where you would actually start solving some problems, right? So you're going to apply all this to quantum mechanics. Uh, looks like it looks like it's kind of geared towards QED to me, right? It looks like that's where it's geared to. Let me change the page here. Then we've got the Schrodinger equation. Let's see. I'm, I'm working. I'm wrestling with the book, obviously, to get this. Here. The Schrodinger equation. Uh, wave equations to particle motion, Dirac notation. You know, it's interesting. One thing, I, I have a great book called Relativistic Wave Equations. You can actually solve, uh, uh, you can do quantum mechanics with relativistic wave equations. You don't need QED for everything, right? Um, there definitely is a time, well, there's definitely a time where the Schrodinger equation itself is invalid and you would use, say, the Dirac equation. And then you, you can treat the Dirac equation like a wave function in a certain regime without having to use QED. Um, it's not done too much, but it does yield some good mathematics, and I, I kind of learned that way. Probably, bad, probably a bad idea, but that is where I, I started. But anyway, wave equations for particle motions, the uncertainty principle, interpretation of the Dirac spinner components. Uh, first of all, I'm really glad he use, he's interested in interpretations. I think that's a really valuable concept. Um, interpretations in quantum mechanics is something people just go on and on and on about. And um, uh, I'm not paid enough to think fully about it. Uh, there seems there's just too much to it. Um, but uh, it'll be interesting to see what he says. He, given that he only writes one page on it, I'm sure he's just listing the different interpretations and basically kissing it up to God and saying, good luck to you. <laughs> Enjoy researching that yourself. Okay, so then we get to quantum field theory. So now we have the spin zero, spin a half field theory, interacting fields theory, the Dyson series, and the time evolution of states. Well, there it is. There is the, that should be the development of the, uh, that in principle, that part should be the development of uh, Feynman diagrams, but I, I can't see how, I, I don't know, we'll see. Um, it doesn't seem like it's long enough, right? In fact, I, 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 I doubt there's any Feynman diagrams done in here. And then uh, it's interesting, his application is in quantum field theory for chapter nine, and then chapter 10, he goes back to classical mechanics, relativistic mechanics, uh, the Lagrangian of non-relativistic mechanics, and then just straight up um, electrodynamics. Then there's a chapter on gravity, which seems to last about six pages. Um, and then there's some mathematical stuff in the back. All right. Well, you know, it, it does seem like these key topics are a little bit weak. Let me uh, catch up on the comments before I move on. This is going to be part one. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. I'm watching a live stream of physics textbook unboxing. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, 
<laughs> but you know what? This is the book purchased. It was essentially purchased by the uh, community on the stream. So I'm proud to reveal it to everybody. Um, Leon Laterman on symmetry. You know, uh, Anu Anupam, you mentioned a book by Laterman. Is it a textbook? I know he wrote a bunch of popular books, which I do not enjoy, although I do remember one metaphor that he presented for how science and particle physics works that was really, really uh, enlightening, and I do use it a lot, but we don't, we don't, uh, we don't uh, waste our time with trivializations of, uh, of science here. Please make a series on QFT. You know, you're not the only one who asked. I think the idea is we'll do some topical lectures on it first and see how that goes. Um, uh, DeBio's proper course on QST would take forever, but if done correctly, it would be amazing. DeBio, so you're rec so so Philanda, you're recommending a certain book. If you if you throw the reference out there, I'll have a quick look. Um, if you think it's good and you think it can be done, you know I have I have time. That's for sure. I mean, meaning I don't I will go through it correctly if it's that good. But I have a lot of QFT books, but I do agree. None of them, when I was a student, they certainly did not help. They confused me more. I mean, you know, slowly I would check, hack away at the subject. But if um, if we could find, if, if you, as time goes on, the ability to teach this stuff does get better, right? For, that's what this book very well might be an example of that. So if if you think DeBio's Q, QFT book is great, then let me know, send, send me the link or put the link in the chat and I will, um, you know, link it to the Amazon page or something and I'll, and I'll dig it up. Uh, uh, let's see what else he says. I really like the way he portrays every lesson. Yeah, that that's true. We 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 it's. Although I am tempted to try. Um, uh, oh wait a minute! Wait a minute! I'm sorry, Philonda. You're at DeBio's. You're not referencing a textbook. You're you're asking uh, about a course straight up. Sorry, sorry, I'm I'm getting used to the notation here. You're referring to DeBio, right? Um, yeah. So I guess I should be addressing DeBio, right? The idea I think will be to uh, do some topical stuff. Like, well, I I really would love to do a full Feynman diagram calculation. Just assume the Feynman rules and go through uh, a second order calculation with renormalization. I think that would be a really good couple lessons, and um, and then uh, maybe build up the Feynman architecture from the ground up. I think if people were really comfortable with the Feynman architecture from the ground up, and did one calculation, that'd be good enough. You know, but the irony is, I'm I'm talking about that as though what I just said is not a complete course in QFT. That virtually is a complete semester or quarter at least of, of QFT. Um, uh, uh, to be honest, live. Uh, let's see. So I think uh, let's just go ahead and move on. So let's looking. Let's start looking into this idea. What is it that he wants to talk about? What we cannot derive. So he's, he begins by saying, and I'll read it out loud, before we talk about what we can derive from symmetry, let's clarify what we need to put into theories by hand. Ah, really nice. Standard model, there's like 27 numbers. And in the book, I reference, I've, I've been pitching my book for some reason, but it's available on Patreon. It's not very expensive, but in the book I wrote, Qualified to Complain, the whole point of that book was to illuminate each of the 27 by hand constants. First of all, there's presently no theory is able to derive the constants of nature. These constants need to be extracted from experiments. Examples are the coupling constants, the various interactions, and the masses of the elementary particles. Yep, I love that subject. Besides that, there is something else we cannot explain, the number three. This should not be some kind of number mysticism, but we cannot explain all sorts of restrictions that are directly connected with the number three. You know, uh, before I even finish reading this paragraph, this really is an interesting question. He's he's also also the number four, and we didn't study homotopy. We we didn't study algebraic topology much. We we just did some enough right to get by. But 
there are topological problems in three and four dimensions that nobody knows the answer to, but they've completely done one and two and they've done all five and more. It's like five dimensions or more is so much freedom that you can actually do things in those dimensions and prove things in those dimensions. But three dimensions and four dimensions, it's really tough. For example, I, I, I'm, no math, I'm no deep, deep mathematician, but um, classifying manifolds in three and four dimensions I, is an unsolved problem. But I think classifying them in like five or higher it is solved. So that's cool. There are three gauge theories corresponding to the three fundamental forces described by the standard model. Um, okay, fair enough. Uh, there are three lepton generations and three quark generations. Why aren't there a fourth? We only include the three lowest order in phi in the Lagrangian, where phi denotes here something generic that describes our physical system. And the Lagrangian is the object we use to derive our theory from in order to get sensible theories to for describing things. Yeah, true, true, true. We only use three lowest dimensional representations of the double covering of the Poincaré group which corresponds to spin zero, one half, and one. Let's move over here. There is no fundamental particle with spin three halves. Okay. So in present theory, these things are assumptions we have to put in behind, by hand. We know they are correct from experiments, but there's no deeper principle about why we have to stop after three. In addition, there's one thing that can't be derived from symmetry, but must be taken into account in order to get a sensible theory. We are only allowed to include the lowest possible non-trivial order in the differential operator uh, partial mu in the Lagrangian. For some theories, there are first order derivatives. For other theories, Lorentz invariants forbid first order derivatives and therefore second order derivatives are the lowest possible non-trivial order. Otherwise, we don't get a sensible theory. Theories with higher order derivatives are unbounded from below, which means the energy in such theories can be arbitrarily negative. Therefore, states in such theories can always transition to lower energy states and are never stable. Finally, there is another thing we cannot derive the way we derive the other theories in this book, gravity. Of course, there is a beautiful and correct theory of gravity called general relativity. Hey, just as a general note, notice how he says, there is a beautiful and correct theory of gravity, comma, called general relativity. It is a grammatical pet peeve of mine. When you use the word called, right, like he's used right here, called. What this means is the next words he's using is the name of something. And because the next words are the name of something, they should actually be in quotation because you're not referring to general relativity itself, you're referring to the name of the theory. So you're using the words general relativity as words themselves. And I think that should be separated into uh, quotation marks. That's arguable though. I, it's hard to find the grammatical rule about that. But anyway, um, but this theory worked quite differently than other theories, and a complete derivation lies beyond the scope of this book. Quantum gravity as an attempt to fit gravity into the same scheme as other theories is still a theory under construction. Okay, so he's really interested in this idea of the number three, and it is intriguing. I, I do remember thinking, you know, why are there three plus one dimensions, right? You know, that's certainly a question people have asked, and I remember, you know, being told that that's a big kind of mystery, but the presumption was that it really does have something to do with this uh, uh, algebraic topology, you know, proof that three and four dimensions is just really, really a, a different kind of space than one, two, and five and higher. So, so that is pretty, pretty good idea. Pretty, pretty cool thought. Um, I don't know. Um, that's the introduction about what we can't derive. Um, there was a time when I was a kid, I do remember there was a book written by a crackpot named uh, Fritz Capra. And that was around the time where the eightfold way was a big deal. And the number eight was the big mystery back then, right? So he was, this, our guy's making the number three the big deal. But back in the day, the number eight was the big deal. And of course, it really... You know, the eightfold way was just a, a complete crock because the number eight was was arbitrary and accidental. You know, and now the idea we have uh, all the quarks, right? We have the six quarks and then the six anti quarks, and the number eight doesn't even matter anymore. I think the number eight was 
if you take the three lightest quarks, you can make eight different particles out of them, right? So that became the eightfold way. But of course, turns out there's number eight suddenly becomes very uninteresting. Okay, anyway, the book overview. The book uses natural units. I want to compliment everybody for natural units. That he just launches into that, natural units. Um, and our starting point will be the basic assumption of special relativity. All right, so that's where that's the prerequisite he's laying down for us. Special relativity, cool. Uh, velocity of light is the same value seen in all inertial frames, blah, blah, blah. The, the set of all transformations permitted in this symmetry is, is called the Poincaré group. We discuss the mathematical theory that enables us to work in the symmetries. This is called group theory, irreducible representations of the Poincaré group. Um, let's see, okay, so here, here again we have this I should see I should try to track this on the camera a little better sorry I hope I'm not making you guys sick if you're still with me so here's the uh, the number three and then three right so he's kind of linking them together here we'll drive the representation of the double cover of the Poincaré group the term double cover comes from the observation that the map between the double cover of a group and the group itself maps two elements of the double cover to one element of the group all right Nice to be technically correct, for sure. Um, these representations are what we later use to describe particles and fields of different spin. On the one hand, spin is an abstract label for different kinds of particles, fields, and on the other hand, can be seen as something like an internal angular momentum. We will discuss in detail how this comes about. Well, that's fun. That's that, I mean, that's really cool, right? Um, the Lagrangian formalism is introduced, which makes working with symmetries in physical context very convenient. Very convenient, right? The central object is the Lagrangian. Different Lagrangians describe different physical systems. The Euler-Lagrange equations are derived. So that's very standard stuff, right? I mean, that you can get that in, in classical mechanics books, right? but I guess that's where we're angling here. The central idea here is that the Lagrangian must be invariant under any transformation of the Poincaré group. This makes sure that the equations of motion take the same form in all frames of reference. Sure, and that's also where gauge theory comes from too, because what you do is you start saying, well, not only does the Lagrangian have to be invariant under the Poincaré group, which is kind of, well, I shouldn't say easy, but if the space-time indices are all handled like we've learned in what is a tensor, Right. If there, if basically everything is is well, all the tensor indices, the space-time indices must uh, cancel because Lagrangian should be just a single number, a real number. So, but if the indices are there and they're being summed away, then you know you have an invariant under the Poincaré group. Then on top of that, you start adding other symmetries that have their own indices, and those are the gauge symmetries. And so. Uh, I presume he's going to talk about some of them. Although I got to say, I looked in the table of contents. I don't remember the word gauge showing up, right? But he does say internal symmetry, right? So that's close. That's a, I mean, that's what a gauge symmetry is, right? Um, invariance under U1 transformations. Yeah, but that's, so that's going to be a spin symmetry. We usually don't consider spin. I mean, spin is an internal symmetry, but we like to think of it more as angular momentum. Anyway, uh, we discussed symmetry breaking and the special way to break symmetry is called the Higgs mechanism. All right. Well, he's going to have to cover all of that if he's going to do the Higgs mechanism. So that's good. Uh, Nether's theorem is derived. This leads us to the most important equation of quantum mechanics, which is he has as the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the equation relating complement complementary observables, right? Momentum and uh, position in this case. Um, and quantum field theory where those uh, fields get sort of quote unquote promoted to operators. And then blah, blah, goes on. We take a look at free quantum field theory. Let's see, and Ernfest theorem, uh, basic structure, of modern theories of gravity called general relativity is briefly introduced. Yeah, 
you're not going to spend a lot of time making progress on GR in this book, I, I don't think. Not with just a few pages at the end. Uh, the major part of this book is about the tools we need to work with symmetries mathematically and about the derivation of what is known as the standard model. Oh, well, that's good. So he's written a book just like mine then, or maybe the other way around. <laughs> um, uh, every every uh, old other theory introduced here can be seen to follow from the standard model as a special case. All right, all right. So elementary particles and fundamental forces, Pauli's exclusion principle. Let's see, he starts to list a bunch of important things that he's going to talk about. The weak force mediated by the bosons. Yeah, that's a, that's a tricky piece of math. Um, separating up the standard model so that you get W plus, W minus, and Z, it's fun, but damn, it's like really hard. Um, some are massless, some are not, spontaneous symmetry breaking, all very, very interesting. And it, it's kind of it's kind of a weird blend of like, can we get an undergraduate deep into particle physics? I mean, I see the problem, right? You can easily graduate as an undergraduate physicist, and you could be really good at a lot of physics, and you could be really good at a lot of physics calculations, but it, it is totally possible that you could be credible and still have never studied general relativity and have no idea about fundamental particles, which is really, or cosmology. And those are like like the, the, the most interesting pieces of physics. It's like that stuff doesn't mean anything until you go to grad school. And I think this book's trying to say, you know, we gotta get our undergraduates a little deeper into this subject. Um, and get the benefit of these advanced, these these more more relevant topics, um, because you know basically all the classical man mechanics you might do as a physicist, you probably would turn that over to engineers at this point, right? You know, I don't think I don't I don't I wonder how many physicists were needed to arrange NASA's flyby of uh, of Pluto. Oh, well, you know, I. I I don't. I, sh I should be careful because I have no idea, and I bet it's. I bet it's definitely many. <laughs> anyway, so then you list the quarks there. That's cool. Different particles can be identified. Huh? Look how blurry this is. Why? Hold on. Sorry, guys. It didn't it just get. It wasn't this blurry a split second ago, right? How did it get so blurry? You guys, you're probably getting nauseous. Oh, there. The camera's just has a little struggling to focus. Different particles can be identified through labels. Those charges, is another, those particles, charges the masses. There's another incredibly important label called spin, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, all right, so let's see how this goes. Uh, before we begin, let me see if I can catch up on the chat. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I missed a lot of chat because I was I was talking here. Uh, concerning wave functions with the Dirac equation, that's actually common in relativistics, Bohmian mechanics. Dirac particles move on by, yeah. Uh, ba 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 ba. Um, the problem is is that uh, wave functions with the Dirac equation, it, it's just it just gives you the wrong answers uh, at some at, at any interesting well not any but at many interesting phases it'll just give you the wrong answer. So whether Bohm did it or not doesn't um, change the fact that it just there's a regime very quickly where it doesn't apply. Um, there are many ways to approach QFT, and I think that's what confuses me. You know, um, uh, there are many ways to approach QFT. Uh, I suppose the two ways to approach QFT have to do with these path integrals versus just going straight into perturbation theory um, and then coming back and reinterpreting it through path integrals. Uh, if, if I were to do it, I would just go straight through perturbation theory. Um, that's just the way I learned it and it worked fine. So, but it is true if, uh, 
if you were to try to like grab another, if you were trying to get clarification and then you grab another book and it's focusing on path integrals, then all of a sudden you'll, you will get confused. Um, it was believed from Landau theory that phase transition was connected with the breaking of symmetry. I seem to remember that, but this was shown by Tholis and Kosterlik and Haldane is not absolutely true where a phase transition is connected with the topology, topological phase transitions. You know, I, I seem to remember stuff about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, phase transitions are just such a, more stuff has been written about phase transitions, you know, than uh, uh, this discontinuities in uh, physical laws are really, really interesting. A lot of statistical mechanics is done on that. Um, in fact, uh, didn't uh, didn't that guy Lee Smolin? He wrote whole books about cosmologies that predicated on the notion of a phase transition in the cosmos. Some really amazing stuff. Um, uh, Dene has asked if there are other textbook unboxings. Well, <laughs> I just called it that spontaneously. I was just so excited I got this book for everybody. But the point is, is that uh, uh, you know, I guess you know, look if. If there are books that you guys think are really worth having a look at, the problem is, is what's going to happen here, right? I mean, this is, the book is hundreds of pages, and I'm not going to go through every one. At some point, you're going to realize huh, that unboxing was a little anticlimactic. I, I mean, I don't know how you would actually do. It's not like a, a guitar, right? A guitar unboxing is awesome. You pull it out. You show it off. You you show the color. the Then you plug it in. You play a few tunes, and everybody's excited about it. If you're really good at a guitar unboxing, you dismantle it, take it apart, and you look at the pickups and stuff. You know, it, we're not going to review this entire book, but anyway, <laughs> but we'll see. Maybe we can come up with a standard method of unboxing a book. Um, uh, yeah, Denise, you agree with the quotation mark thing? It, it's weird because people are afraid that if you use quotation marks like that, you might be you, you might be pretending like it's a scare quote, but it's not. It's supposed to be uh, identifying the name of something. Nice diagram. Were you referring to this diagram back here? Let me, let me return to that. Uh, this diagram back here. All right, let's have a look at that since you brought it up. The double cover of the Poincaré group. Uh, let's see. what, what He's brought, broken it down to irreducible representations. The... Uh, the spin one half representation as the direct sum of the uh, one half zero and zero one half. Notice notice that um, the zero zero rep one half one half is the spin one rep. Yep 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 yep. Now it's interesting. You might think of this as um, as tensor rank notation, but we got to be careful. It, it's it's not that right. It's close though. It's close. So uh, we'll have we'll, we will be talking about that in the Lee group stuff as we do go on. Yeah, that is a nice nice chart. Proca Dirac Klein Gordon equation derived from these representations. That's sort of what they're after. You know, I gotta admit, I, I mean, first of all, I, I'm pretty much pretty sure I've seen Proca spelled with a C <laughs> for what it's worth. But I gotta admit, I'm embarrassed to say that I don't think I've ever walk through a solution of the Proca equation my, by myself, right? Okay, so now let's go back through this. Ah, oh, damn, there's that focusing problem. Oh, there it goes. Um, invariance of the speed of light, special relativity. What is he talking about here? So he does the typical, in the marginal comment, he does the typical. This, this is a really nice, easy proof. If you ever want to show anybody why time dilation is a thing, or not why time dilation is a thing. If you want, ever want to show somebody how the assumption of the constancy of the velocity of light for all observers, what that actually implies and how to make it, uh, um, how to uh, sell the point. The light clock is by far the best because you just have to write down that the only assumption you're making is all light for all people, all measurements of all light. So all measurements of all light that are done locally or without the presence of gravity. We'll just say that. So we don't even have to say done locally. We'll just say without the, in the absence of gravity, 
any light measured by any person or any observer um, must be measured to have the velocity c. And once you and you can solve for how this light clock would tick time if the light was more like a, a ping pong ball. And then if you applied the rule that it must always be measured to have a velocity c, you can see how time dilation is an immediate result of that. And it also, doing the exercise, drives home what it means for all measurements of light by any observer to have the same velocity, why that's a significant fact, why that's not just sort of trivial. Because if you didn't think deeply about it, you'd think, well, that doesn't sound so weird. You know, so then he talks about the notion of proper time, right? The idea of proper time is so important in general relativity because that's how we parameterize our geodesics usually. So then there's a lot of typical stuff here about a world line. That's really good. Um, it's interesting because right here he's using delta s equals ct prime squared. Didn't he promise that they were going to use natural units? Maybe he thinks it's too soon to, to use natural units. But um, if you're not going to use natural units, this is the place to do it because you really can't do a lesson on special relativity and talk about the constancy of the speed of light without having that constant there. If you if you got rid of it and if you just wrote delta s equals delta s prime equals delta delta s squared equals delta t prime squared, not having the c there, kind of, you're burying the lead a little bit. So I guess this is a good place to not use natural units. Um, Minkowski notation, right? Um, the big point here is to, is there's no i in, um, in uh, this expression. But you know what? I haven't seen i in an expression in so long. I don't even think people comment on it anymore. <laughs> um, and uh, let's see, introduction to the Minkowski metric, right? Got to do that eventually, right? That's important. The problem is, is there's nothing about this book that would inspire me to use it as a lesson for this channel because it's so, it's at this point, it's elementary. Given that we've done GR and tensors, there's nothing here that is very telling. The Lorentz transformation, this is, uh, this is a nice, uh, Let's just look at the notation they choose to use. They use, you know, the Greek indices. Uh, they they choose to do the second coordinate system with a prime on the letter, right? I I'm, I always check this stuff out. I, I find this interesting. So the the original coordinate system is unprimed variables. The the new coordinate system is prime variables with the same index, right? So. The way I do it is I use the same variable, but I prime the index, right? And I'm sure, and ultimately in van der Weyerden notation, he's going to have to do that because that's like the way it's done. That's the rule in van der Weyerden notation for spinners. But anyway, um, uh, I don't like this because you could confuse the two indices. You have to realize, oh, an index, a mu under a prime variable is different from a mu under an unprime variable. Um, anyway, um, uh, yeah, whatever. I mean, obviously, that's sort of the, this. Um, this, though, this is really important. Getting this notation down is very important in special relativity because we throw Lorentz transformations around, and the way we do it is just with a little matrix. And well, matrix notation in a way, and that lambda is that sort of matrix notation. Uh, if you do a quantum field theory, you will always see this kind of this kind of thing. Uh, lambda is typically used. And when I first read a book by uh, Steven Weinberg, a quantum field theory book by Steven Weinberg, um, uh, there was so many lambdas, and it was trivializing something that I thought was really hard to understand, but doesn't matter how hard it is to understand once you've got it once you've got the idea of a Lorentz transformation right once you've got this down it that's what it becomes it becomes like lambda <laughs> the whole thing becomes lambda all right let's keep going here invariance symmetry and covariance um, 
and here's the big the big here's the big reveal. Firstly, we call something invariant if it not does not change under transformations. Let me have a look quick here at the chat. Yeah, I agree with you, Adam. That that is a kind of a nice diagram. Um, uh, some random person they assume mathematical prerequisites for group. I don't think they do. Um, I think he's going to try to lay down the essence of group theory. You know, just defining what a group is, and he's only going to do it in three pages. So I, I'm not sure about that, but that is what his plan is. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah. Let's see. Whoa, sorry. Uh, sounds a bit like the three blue, one brown guy. I don't think so. He, he's got such, he's got such a warm sell to his voice he doesn't have he has so much um authority about what he says i i'm very sketchy <laughs> because i don't i don't um i don't i don't you know i i half prepare right i kind of work through things on the fly a bit and and he just is so precise and uh uh and and that shows in his voice right it shows in his voice uh but no, uh, uh, let's see, uh, ooh, big book. This is, you know, it's a big book like by height and width, but not in depth, right? It's actually pretty skinny in depth. Let me, I should show you how skinny in depth it is. There it is, uh, you know, uh, how, how do you, what's the relative? That's the edge of the book. Here's my, the tip of my pen, right? So that's not a very deep book. It's got a bunch, it's got plenty of pages, I suppose, but, but, um, uh, I mean, how many pages does it have? They're beautiful paper. It's really nice paper. I'm just, I can't, I'm kind of, it's 287 pages at the end of the index. I'm a little flabbergasted. It only cost me 30 bucks or cost our patrons 30 bucks. All right, so let's go on. Lee group theory. So let's see how they do this. Uh, the fundamental representations of the double cover of the Poincaré group. That is the goal of this chapter. So, there you have it. That's what you're supposed to understand. The fundamental representations of the double cover of the Poincaré group. You know what? That's a topic worth teaching. Maybe we should just zero in on just that topic because I was going to do representation theory, right? Um, uh, I, I was going to do representation theory, so why not give this book a shot and just play, you know, play professor and uh, or or play as though this book was being used to 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 make that point but i would i would if i did that i would assume everybody had watched the lee group the what is a lee group lectures on the channel up to the point and then i would probably fly through this hopefully although you can never really fly through anything uh thanu padamandaband I'm, I'm sorry i'm reading chat now summit day wrote uh thanu Padmanabhans. I, I like to get these names pronounced correctly. Summit, tell me how well I did. Thanu Padmanaban uh, might be a good option. Um, tell me why, Summit. I'm curious to know what is your um, what is your uh, uh, what is your endorsement of that book that makes it good. I, I really do only want to deal with texts that are very modern. There's there's not too many older, uh, with the big exception being general relativity, but any other physics topic besides general relativity, uh, I'd rather deal with the more modern books, the more modern efforts. I think, I think uh, people, authors today are really becoming deeply efficient at this. Um, Uh, QFT is so different from the regular non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Uh, well, um, yeah, you know, it's all about uh, it's all about uh, particle creation, right? It's all about having so much. It's all about when your mass, when the mass energy of the problem is larger than the rest, is comparable, not even larger, just comparable to the rest mass. Um, 
that's when all these problems show up and there's just simply nothing in uh, non-relativistic quantum mechanics that can handle that. Um, uh, what is the difference between mathematics of undergraduate quantum mechanics and QFT? Um, uh, let's see. So, huh. That is a good question. Um, you know, ma undergraduate quantum mechanics requires mathematics through partial differential equations, Sturm Louisville theory. Uh, the WKB approximation is a, you know, you're really talking about some, some tricky uh, uh, differential equations and, and ways to handle differential equations. Quantum field theory, it, there's this. There's this, I mean, I mean, you definitely need group theory and representations to really get at it. And, and that is important. You certainly need, op, you need, you know, I was going to say you need operators, but those, the operators you use are exactly the ones you learn. You need field theory. Basically, the difference is you need field theory, right? In quantum mechanics, the wave function is actually a field, right? It puts a complex number at every point in space time. So the wave function is a field in a way. And it is capable of having a Lagrangian with interactions, just like quantum field theory. But in quantum field theory, the operators themselves are fields. And that is the big difference. So you're dealing with that. And then um, the integ you know, the, but you know, the integrations that you use to you, you know, yes. So the Feynman rules involve uh, integrals over spinners. So you have to understand what spinners are. So that's the Dirac equation. You don't usually see the Dirac equation in undergraduate quantum mechanics, although it's not, it wouldn't be unusual if you did. But, you know, it's, QFT is just more. It's just, everything is a little bit subtler. It's, all, it's, you're, 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 you're trying to learn, and but that's true of quantum mechanics too, right? One mistake some students make when they learn quantum mechanics and everything harder is 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 once you've gone through regular physics, even up to E and M, you say, yeah, you know, I, I think I get this. I I can follow this. This makes a lot of sense. But once the wheels come off of abstraction and our ability to intuit, intuit reality, students say, geez, I don't think I could have figured this out. And they blame themselves by through this weird thing that's going on in their subconscious mind where they're saying, you know, if it was left up to me to invent quantum mechanics, I never would have figured this out. You know, if, if I was here, if I was Max Planck or Einstein in the early days or Heisenberg, I mean, this stuff is just so weird. I, I couldn't have figured it out. And ergo, because I can't imagine ever having figured it out or participated in figuring out, ergo, I don't understand it. And that's really an unfair way of looking at things. And I don't think that's a straw man uh, argument about what's happening to students. I really do think that that there is something like that going on. We're, we almost feel inadequate because we don't immediately get it. And the thing that people don't remember is nobody immediately got it, right? These people that we we deify as the people who created this stuff did so over like a 50 year period and did it very piecemeal and very ad hoc and and there was no systematic development there was there was a a, a a genius guy who came up with one genius idea that took a while for everybody to understand and then everybody got on board and then everybody understood that idea right if you understand special relativity, wasn't, wasn't there a famous guy who said special relativity is so bizarre there's only like five people in the world who understand it. And now I literally can teach it to anybody, right? I mean, and not me. I mean, anybody can teach it's, it's that easy. It's like the starting point theory, right? So, so um, I, I don't know, that's a little bit of a, a rant on, 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 on learning this stuff. Um, Uh, there is a course on YouTube being uh, promoted here. Let's see. Uh, 
let's see, the most gangster QFT source was the one from Sidney Coleman. He would start smoking in the middle of the lecture. <laughs> okay, yeah. Won't see that here, that's for sure. Um, let's see. So you guys are talking about different QFT. Boy, it seems like everybody really wants QFT. I, I just wish, um, I just wish that, uh, um, uh, I, I just wish that, um, uh, you know, when you think QFT, you really should think QED, right? You got to get quantum electrodynamics down first, right? Quantum field theory without understanding, I mean, without understanding quantum electrodynamics, I just wouldn't waste time on that. Okay. Uh, the uh, name and author of this book is, uh, uh, the book is Physics from Symmetry, and the author's name is Jacob Switchenberg. Okay, but let's go on to this. Sorry, sorry, I got distracted by the chat. Um, we will start with the definition of a group, okay? See, that's great, right? I mean, this seems absurd to me, right? He his, his goal is this noble, really good goal, and he's going to begin with the definition of a group. Okay, um, that's an awful long way to go. <laughs> but let's see. We'll try to find similar second description of rotations in three dimensions. Let's see. So they, he here it is. Here's his beginning thing on groups. And you can kind of see he's doing the usual thing about rotating a, a geometric object. You know, there he is. So, you know, uh, uh, then, you know, he's talking about the transformations of a geographic geometric object you know and then ultimately it takes them three pages to get to this right the definition of a group closure identity inverse associativity a set with an operation so fair enough but uh, so then rotations in two dimensions describing those groups uh, rotations with unit complex numbers. So now this is the gr this is the groundwork he's going to have to lay to do um, SU two, right? So so that's fine. Um, the page prior he he introduced uh, the idea of a transpose, the idea of the determinant for of a matrix. But uh, God, it's just such a beautiful. It really is a lovely book. Um, you know, I mean, this is pretty elementary stuff, right? Look, the unit complex numbers lie in the unit circle of the complex plane. I mean, he's really not pushing the boundaries of prerequisites here. <laughs> Let's see, rotations in three dimensions. So finally he gets to that. Now the big thing he's going to have to do here, of course, is the non-commutivity. And somewhere in here is where I guess Lie algebras is going to start popping out. Well, he hasn't even done Lie groups yet, right? But the three by three rotation matrices, and then talking about the rotation of a single vector, right? And then quaternions. So let's see what he does here. Um, with the quaternions, defines just a simple de definition, talks about the idea of, um, of, I guess, I guess, the, is that the word? The dagger symbol, transposition plus complex conjugation. And then, then he does. Uh, this is this is actually a really good subject that does often get missed in quaternions. Is showing that quaternions can be expressed in a basis of two by two matrices, right? Now notice this would be a basis for quaternions. So, um, well, whatever. I mean, that's what they are, right? And defining the determinant, and then so he's just basically describing how quaternions are represented and how they work. Let's see what this page has on it. Um, then he does rotation matrices with quaternions. Um, let's see. So I guess the way he plans to do it is, I guess I'll look over here for you, is this expression right here, 3.37. 
uh, he's essentially writing that in a quaternionic form using the, those matrices he showed us. And, uh, you know, I, J, K, whenever you see that, that's going to be a quaternion. So that's just a purely, what's the word? Uh, the, is, do they still say, do we say that's the imaginary part of a quaternion? What, how do we refine the, uh, just the, the, the part that's not just a pure real number? I can't remember the word. And then, um, and then we get down to, uh, well, basically, this is where he starts to show the double cover thing, right? He, he uses this to show that that 2 pops in or the, the phi over 2 pops in for the angle, so you get this double cover. All right, fair enough. So then, then sure enough, the Lie algebra has to show up here. Otherwise, none of this makes any sense. Um, and then at some point, he's going to have to show that we have group generators, right? So that's what he's doing here. A little bit of group generator stuff. All right, fair enough. And then we, we, we did all this in the, uh, the Lee group lessons. So this is, we, we, we would skip all this if we even covered this book, this stuff. Um, and then of course, so, so this is actually a place where you really need to see a good worked example. I'm not a big fan of hugely detailed worked examples always, but in the Lee group stuff I was, I really did enjoy doing this calculation and actually working this out in great detail and developing the actual matrices that were relevant here. And then he presents, um, uh, so the idea here is that two elements of the Lie group can be expressed as exponentiations on the Lie algebra. X and Y are probably part of the Lie algebra. And this is, uh, you combine these two this way using this uh, Baker, Campbell, Hausdorff formula. Um, yeah, I think we demonstrated that. I can't remember if we demonstrated that or not. And now, now we go to the generators of SO3. So this is hopefully, eventually here he's going to make contact with quantum mechanics. What's interesting is, is here's a good point. I wonder if he's going to make this point, because this is a big deal that for me. Is if you look at equation 3.58 here, you see that every group element O can be written in terms of a generator J, right? And it's this exponentiation of a generator J, and the parameter is theta, right? That's what 3.58 says. And then if you look at their generators J, right, here's, here's an example of these generators, J1, J2, and J3. Notice that they're all real matrices, right? All three of these are real. Now in physics, you may remember that these operators um, are Hermitian, right? And it goes back to this. This would normally be e to the i theta j in physics, right? Or j would actually have an imaginary piece to it. And the reason is, is that the, the math, if you build up the math, you end up with, um, you end up with anti, anti-Hermitian operators or anti-Hermitian um, generators. But physicists like Hermitian generators, so there's always going to be an I added in there somewhere. <laughs> and that difference is quite confusing to make the connection between these two. I'm, I'm anxious to see if he actually does it. Um, and then here he's talking about now making a finite transformation. Again, we did this in our Lie group theory book course already. But this is this is the example that I was talking about uh, about a page ago. This is a good example of, you know, this is a pretty easy one, but uh, uh, showing how you can actually execute this exponentiation to get the actual group element. I think that's an important lesson to do. So that's, that's a really nice example there. And... Um, and then let's see, ah, I think I see it right here, right? I think I see it right here. Oh, I'm going to, I'm excited about this part. 
Um, let's see. We now have the generators of the Lie group in explicit matrix form, right? Let me look this up. And allows us to calculate the Lie bracket relationship. In physics, it's conventional to define the generators of FO3 with an extra i. Concretely, this means that instead of e to the phi j, we write e to the i phi j with phi equals minus the conjugate, right? Right, exactly. So now you see the three generators, boom, they have the imaginary piece. And the Lie algebra has that i suddenly introduced in the commutation relation, right? Because we like Hermitian generators. Good, 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 good. Yeah, see, I think that's that shows that he's pretty dedicated to the idea of saying, look, we're going to explain this mathematically, but now we have to face the fact that physicists just have a different convention out there. That's great. I'm glad he said that. You don't see that very often. Uh, I wrote th I wrote about that a lot in my work, but of course I'm not a published author, so good for him. Uh, let's take a bit of a break and go into the chat again. Um, well, you're talking about a book on field theory. What do you expect? So I, I guess, um, uh, yeah, I guess this is a book on field theory. I didn't think of it that way, um, uh, Shikar. I, I don't. I guess you're. I'm not, I don't know if your first name is Amar or Shikar. Um, I have a good friend named Amar, <laughs> uh, but um, I didn't. When I got this book, it said symmetry, physics from symmetry, but it did not. Uh, it, it did not suggest to me that it was literally a book on field theory. And actually, I'm not sure that it literally is. Um, but uh, so, so no, I wouldn't call this book on field theory. Anyway, uh, let's see. Um, hello from Russia. Is there a chance you would do a classic group theory series? It would be great to see your perspective on this. You know, I got to say, I'm, I'm inclined to do it. Uh, while I do a classic group theory series will be part of this representation theory review that I'm going to do. So I think so, games and thoughts. I, I think so. Stay tuned to the Lee group playlist. And I think the next lesson is literally going to be a quick, a, a few um, elementary group theory reviews, at least topical, right? Uh, group actions are an important subject. Um, Things that show up in, in Lie groups is nilpotent nil groups and uh, solvable groups. So we got to get that down. So I think uh, uh, I will. I've already done a review of the most important concept, which is um, uh, uh, homomorphisms, the kernels of homomorphisms, and normal invariant subgroups of groups, right? That's really important too. So yeah, so keep an eye out on that. Um, quaternion representations are just poly matrices. Are you being sarcastic, Amar? I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, yeah. There's that's uh, that's definitely a pretty common way of doing it. Um, uh, let's see. Z is better. You know, I, I've I've seen Z's book. Uh, it is it is newer. I should check it out. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I should check it out. All right, let's keep going. The abstract. So now, this is interesting. So, the abstract definition of a Lie algebra. This is where his mathematician inside him is showing. Um, this is also what's missing from Gilmore's book that we're studying, is. Lie algebras can actually are they're a thing under themselves. They're not there just to linearize Lie groups. And if you attack them from that perspective, you can build up physics from that angle too, or the relevant physics for that angle. Um, so let's see how his paragraph reads. Up to this point, we have used a simplified definition. The Lie algebra consists of all elements x that result in an element of the corresponding group G when put into exponential into the exponential function an operation and an operation called Lie bracket that we use to combine the Lie algebra elements. So see this is awkward, right? Because you know, I'm I'm going to I'm going to look a, I'm going to guess, but you can define a Lie algebra, but to me the way I would approach this 
is I would define an algebra, right? You need to understand the mathematical idea of an algebra. Without that, what, what, what good is it, right? In other words, a Lie algebra is a type of algebra. Okay, so what's an algebra? So what they want to say is that an algebra is a vector space that has an operation that takes two vectors and produces another vector. Right? We've already discussed vector spaces that have an inner product that take two vectors and return a, re a member of the field, the underlying field, usually for GR, for general relativity, it's a real number, for quantum mechanics, it's a complex number. But uh, a Lie algebra is not, it's not just a vector space with an inner product, it's a vector space with an operation that takes two members of the vector space and gives you a third. But it has addition, it has this sort of multiplication operation, so to speak. Uh, and a Lie algebra has a specific type of binary operation called a Lie bracket. So a Lie algebra is just a very specific kind of algebra. So we need a, so so now he talks about we need a rule to combine Lie algebra elements. So so the rule for the combination of Lie algebra elements is not simply matrix multiplication but but more complicated rule called Lie bracket, right? So the the problem is is that an algebra is a vector space, right? So you already have all the rules you need. Just the word algebra tells you you have all the rules you need. But you combine them with field multiplication, uh, scalar multiplication, and vector addition, which in this case is matrix addition. And you don't have matrix multiplication in a Lie algebra. You have Lie bracket multiplication. That's kind of what he's saying here. But it's kind of weird the way you have to sneak up on this subject if you don't have the notion of an algebra as a as a um, an algebra as a uh, what's the word um, uh, as an algebraic structure right there, there are these algebraic structures and when we discuss them extensively in um, what is a tensor there I think I have two lessons on algebraic structures where I go through all of them from the lowest one which is like a, a I think it's a groupoid they call it I think there's one even below no a monoid is like even lower so the easiest algebraic structure is a monoid and then you end up with you know rings and fields and and all of the more you know you keep adding things and an algebra is somewhere in the middle there but anyway the point is is that this sounds very ad hoc, right? This is stuff I don't like. This sounds very, very ad hoc unless you have really built it up from the bottom. But then again, there's plenty of time for him to fix that. I'm just getting at my, my take on this. So a Lie algebra is a vector space G equipped with a binary operation. So he does actually state these things, right? Um, so I, 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 you know, I, I Clearly, he he says those things. I don't I don't know if he defined a vector space earlier though. Anyway, uh, the point is is this is the abstract idea of a Lie algebra. The problem is the, with the abstract idea is this commutator, this binary operation, comes in in a very ad hoc feeling way, and that's a problem. The other problem is is look at the notation here. He wants to notate a commutator, but his LaTeX and I'm positive this was drafted in LaTeX. He didn't put a space there, so it kind of looks lame. You know, if I were to do this, I would have uh, a bracket and then a semicolon, a comma, and then a semicolon, or a, I guess what is, an escaped semicolon to put in space. This does not look good. His notion for the arbitrary, the general commutator does not look good. I'm a stickler. I love, uh, I love LaTeX and I love typesetting. Here's another problem with this typesetting. Look, see this? See that, that line? That line should be the full length of this guy, of the full length of that parentheses. This means he didn't, he didn't use the right left command in LaTeX or in LaTeX. So because of that, that's just one line. It should be the full thing. That's a, and that's, I don't like that. I think that's a mess. On the other hand, I do like the way he laid out these matrices all together, right? That's, that takes a little bit of work. So some things he did real hard, real, he did a lot of work. Here's another case where the line is not done well. That line saying evaluate at theta equals zero, that theta should be at the bottom, right? 
So his la his LaTeX editor was actually pretty bad. That's that's actually a pretty bad mistake. I think this is a bad mistake too, but that's forgivable. But but they went out of their way to get these Gothic letters right, you know, inline text. That's that's nice. I mean, they they definitely worked the tech the the LaTeX there. Um, Although I gotta say this this is a this is a bad mis this is like <laughs> this this is an obvious one. It's like you you compile your LaTeX and you see that and you're like oh crap you know fix that right away. <laughs> anyway, um, all right. So what else do we got here? So the generators of the Lie algebra of SU two. Um, uh, let's see. The generators of Lie algebra of SU two. Um, do, 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 do. So what's interesting here is when he says abstract, of course, he's no longer using a real matrix, right? He's just using generators and he's, he's really looking for these commutation relations because once you know the commutation relations on the generators, which is what you end up with here, you know the full Lie algebra, right? The whole Lie algebra, if, if you're going to consider Ji and J as, as sort of your basis of the algebra, which they're going to, then this will uh, allow you to calculate the Lie bracket of any two elements of the algebra. Um, and then, of course, the Pauli matrix Cs make their appearance again, which shouldn't be a surprise, given that quaternions also describe rotations. So then he does the abstract definition of a Lie group. Okay, it'll be interesting to see when I read this more closely why he chose that order, Lie algebra and then Lie group. Um, my education was the other way. We learned about Lie groups and then Lie algebras. Obviously, it can be done either way. I think the Lie group has a much better shot at getting an abstract um, uh you, you can understand a Lie group a lot easier in the abstract uh, because it's just less abstract to me. <laughs> I think that's the, the ironic point there. And let's see, what have we got here? We've got the next group we discussed were SU2. Remember, we found a one to one map between SU2 and the unit quaternions. The unit quaternions are defined as those quaternions that satisfy this condition. Um, what is what the heck is that exclamation point doing there? What 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 the what is? Obviously, it's a condition to define the unit quaternions. So I guess what he's clearly wants to say that it's not true for a general quaternion that that's the case. Um, usually, you see the exclamation point in general relativity when you want to emphasize that you you're talking about a relationship that's true in one particular coordinate system. So this notion of particularizing quaternions just to unit ones, I guess that does make, make sense. I've never seen it that way. Um, I, I guess I've not seen that usage that way. But now look at how much the marginal notes are getting used here, right? So now he's really, you know, he's, he's pulling out all the little things, little things that he doesn't have time to say and he's putting it. Oh, here's here it is, right? This is the this is the big sin of all of this kind of study, right there. Footnote number sixty three. That entire little paragraph is about manifolds, right? And <laughs> you you can definitely get away teaching physics with a very very thin definition of manifolds. I hate it, but I I shouldn't expect much different, right? I mean. Like here, look look right there. These observators motivate the modern definition of a Lie group. A Lie group is a group which is also a differentiable manifold. So essentially, he's now calling out the modern definition, and he has made zero effort to define a differentiable manifold, right? And who knows why he's made that choice? It's, I mean, it's a big subject, right? I guess I, when I say who knows why he made that choice, I know why he made that choice. It's a big subject. It would take its own uh, chapter, right? So, you know, so he's he's dancing around it, just like, you know, Denverno dances around it. Um, 
a lot a lot less. I mean, Deverno has to attack it a little bit more, but he still doesn't give it the kind of treatment that you actually need to give it. So, so yeah, so I feel like this is not going to be that super helpful, this chapter for an undergraduate, because he's, they're going to be like, this is all very arbitrary, right? A Lie group is a group which is also a differentiable manifold. His, his definition of a group was literally just nothing more than the definition itself. And he doesn't even define differentiable manifold except for this little paragraph here. And he tries to bind it all together here. So this is a compatibility requirement that ensures that the group property is compatible with the manifold property. That statement, that's the whole point. That's what makes Lie groups what they are. That is deeply profound and really, really fascinating. And we cover it in detail in, in our series, what is, a, what is a Lie group? Or what is, what is our series called? It's, no, Lie groups, Lie algebras, and their representations, where I am literally going through a textbook. So I shouldn't say this is the first time I've done this. I've obviously done it before. But this, the mathematics, that, that compatibility is what makes Lie groups what they are. So interesting. Um, and, but then he has the guts to say, now that he's laid that out, we can now understand the remark at the end of 30, 34, as though anybody who reads the paragraph above, I think they would be hopelessly lost if this was, if this was their first time through this material. So right here, I'm feeling like is where this book will start to go off the rails for an, a true undergraduate course. And it's not his fault, right? I mean, he, he just he's just trying to get through the abstract definition of a Lie group without really talking about the abstract definition of a Lie group. He's just stating the abstract definition, but that's the problem. A statement of the, an abstract definition is by, necessary, by necessity very abstract. Ergo, it seems ad hoc unless you study and take apart the abstraction. I mean, it, it you know, just because it's abstract doesn't mean it can't be explained and understood in detail. I'm, I'm not saying that you have to suddenly make concrete examples, right? You don't. But you do have to, each of these sentences, all right, like let's let's count. A Lie group is a group which is also a differentiable manifold, right? So the group concept and the differentiable manifold, without understanding them, that sentence makes no sense. Furthermore, for the group operations must induce a differentiable map of the manifold into itself. Okay, absolutely, completely unclear if you don't understand. The whole notion of a differentiable map, by the way, is completely contingent on understanding a manifold. The, exist, the, 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 the mathematical structure of a manifold makes the word differentiable map make sense. Those are not two unrelated concepts. The concept of a manifold and the concept of a differentiable map are bound together in a deep understanding of manifolds. So that sentence makes no sense to anybody. This is a compatibility requirement that ensures the group property is compatible with the manifold property, right? Well, yes. Um, I'm not even sure if that sentence makes sense, right? It's a compatibility requirement that ensures it's compatible, <laughs> right? You, you see what I'm, you see the problem there? It, it's the, the second half of the sentence really does not, I mean, it's clear that the group operation must induce a differentiable map on the manifold, and this is a compatibility requirement. All right, I guess there is a little extra content there, but Concretely, oh, okay, here we go. We're going to get some concrete. So we have, an, we have an abstract definition, but we are now going to make a concrete statement about it. Concretely, this means that every group element, say A, there's a comma missing there, right? If you're going to say, say A, comma, induces a map that takes any element of the group B to another element of the group C equals AB. And this map must be differentiable. Using coordinates, this means that the coordinates of AB must be differentiable function. Oh my God, this is a wreck. This is a train wreck of a paragraph, right? Because now he's talking about coordinates. Of course, coordinates are absolutely critical to the understanding of what manifolds are. Manifolds and coordinates are almost like, it's the same idea. But if you don't know that, right, that's not going to, 
then, then all of a sudden what happens is this little marginal comment here, right? A manifold is a set of points, for example, a sphere, another missing comma, that looks locally like flat Euclidean space. Another way of thinking about an n-dimensional manifold is that is a set which can be given coordinates in some neighborhood of a point. For some more information about manifolds, see the appendix. Yeah, okay, well, that's so that's what he's done. He's jammed up everything that would help make sense of this into the appendix, right? But the idea is that the Lie group, every member of the Lie group has coordinates, right? The Lie group is literally a manifold, which means every member can be identified by coordinates. But now suggesting that because this definition is present in our minds, we can understand that there is one distinguished Lie group for each Lie algebra. Uh, and now he's going to talk about that distinguished Lie group as being simply connected. What he's talking about is the universal covering group here. And there's pre precisely one simply connected Lie group corresponding to each Lie algebra. Yeah, you know, boy, he's really, really burning through this concept fast. And, and the ambition here is tremendous. I want you to understand the idea of doing this subject for an undergraduate in this few number of pages, it's almost hopeless. And I'm not impressed so far. I got to say the appendix on man. All right, let's check out the appendix on manifold. What do you think? All right, let's take a look. Um, let me go back to the comments here. Uh, I don't think Z's book is for beginners. I wouldn't, you know, I, I looked at it a long time ago. Nothing, nothing, nothing about quantum field theory is for beginners, right? The, the idea, Sven, that there is a beginner's quantum field theory book, I think that's kind of absurd. Now, having said that, I am looking at a book by a man named McMahon called Quantum Field Theory Demystified. And it's not bad. I, I'm really impressed with this demystified theory. I have three. I have like relativity demystified. I have quantum field theory demystified. And I think I have supersymmetry demystified. And I'll tell you what, they're not terrible books. <laughs> I actually spoke to the author of one of them once and he impressed me a lot with and and these books do a good job of distilling the hard parts and 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 nailing them down so but on the other hand quantum field theory demystified still isn't for beginners if you don't know classical mechanics uh if you don't know good theoretical mechanics if you don't know quantum mechanics at uh, you know a, a substantial level like Quantum mechanics, like you should have done scattering theory in quantum mechanical scattering theory, which is an advanced topic for the undergraduate level. But it's definitely, yes, you've got to have done scattering theory in quantum mechanics. There's no point in studying any QED book, any quantum field theory book, any quantum. I, I, I try to distinguish between QED and QFT. Obviously, they're significantly similar, but the point I'm trying to make is is that there's no beginner. There's no book for a beginner. If you're looking at a book that says it's for beginners, then you know, you're know you looking at like uh, some popularization in National Geographic or something. Uh, uh, games and Thoughts. Remind me Abel's Theorem. Uh, I've been reviewing group theory. I just like, I've, I've backed all the way up to the, like the orbit stabilizer theorem and, and uh, uh, remind me what Abel's theorem is, please. Uh, yeah, this commutator's a little late. I, I kind of went off on a ridiculous tangent there. I'm sorry, Dan. But but it, 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 it just jumps out at you. If you've written this material and you see that, it kind of like goes, like here's another problem. Like look at this, right? This is another problem that an experienced LaTeX person would never do. See, it says top half. And then 67 is a footnote, right? I'll try to get it a little. So you see that there's actually a footnote there, and it refers to this footnote here. Well, first of all, it, it's too close to the F, right? If you see that, you throw in a space. You can do that. It's not hard. You throw in a space. So they didn't throw in a space there. On the other hand, they're not, you know, throwing in all of these SO2s, SU2s in the text, that's a pain in the butt, right? 
there's a lot of reasons and a lot of ways to write your text where you don't have to throw in where every time you refer to this, you don't put it in there, but it's very edifying to do it. So the author definitely took his time to do it, but then he has like this thing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so it's kind of funny. Okay. Um, no, we're not dumping uh, Gilmore Sahaf. Uh, thanks for asking. We will be adding things to Gilmore. No, this is just, I'm just checking into this a little bit. Hopefully this book turns around fast. Um, uh, imagine studying differential manifolds in a paragraph. Yeah, exactly, right, Jimmy. Let, we're going to check out this appendix, though. So let's let's not let's not go too fast too fast on that. Um, it's an undergraduate book. Don't be hard on it. You barely studied. Lee. Well, that's the problem, right, Amar? Is that's that's the whole that's the issue here. It's an undergraduate book, but there's no point teaching an undergraduate something where when they leave they feel like they they feel like they um got a perfunctory level of stuff that doesn't make them any smarter on the subject and that's what i'm worried about with that particular paragraph it's too ambitious right the ambition is very high so i was very excited to see how he pulled it off the problem is is right now in this particular section um uh, it's more like this is more like a review article for somebody who's already studied it. Does he talk about simply connectedness of SN for n graded two compact universal covering groups, etc.? I, I, um, well, yeah. I mean, here he here he does. He talks about it right here, right? He this is it. Um, we there's precisely one distinguished Lie group for each Lie algebra. And that's the universal. And he doesn't say the word universal covering group. So, but he does say it's simply connected. And he bold faces simply connected, right? Um, uh, and he says, we won't discuss this any further, but we, you are encouraged to read about it. Yeah, and, and you're going to have to, right? You're going you're gonna to have to. Um, you know, it's interesting. He does talk about this proof in a book by Spivak. I do have a book by Spivak, but not this one. I probably should get that one. That'd, that'd be worth getting and, and doing this proof. I don't I don't know if I did this proof in the... Did, did anybody take the Lie algebra classes so far? Do you remember whether or not I did the proof that there was only one simply connected Lie group? Or did I just sort of elaborate on... on on what it means and how we got there. I don't think I did the proof. Maybe I, I don't think I know the proof actually. Anyway, um, so, uh, okay, yeah, I said I was gonna check the, the, the appendix. So let me, let me do that. Let me flip it over to the appendix. <laughs> yes, Dennis, I, I kind of feel like, it's a little better than that, than the, Water is a livability requirement that ensures you live. I agree with, I, I felt like that is, right? Um, I think it's a little better than that, you know? <laughs> but yes. Um, uh, there's no need to go on kicking the guy. He's already dead. Oh, is that a shame? Is that, is that true? I, first of all, yeah, I, I um, you're right. First of all, I am being a bit rude. Uh, I, I'm trying to recommend a textbook. I guess in some day I'm allowed to review the book and I guess my statements constitute a book review, right? Um, I, I don't feel like a book review is kicking the guy. Uh, uh, but gee, I don't I don't want to be mean either, Sahaf, so I'll, I'll tone it down. Thanks. Um, uh Try quantum field theory tourist guide for mathematicians. Uh, I mean, Z's book on group theory. Uh, no, no, we're not. Gilmore's book is really it, it's it's good. It's it's really great. It's it's the only book of its kind, and um, 
you know, I found something in that book that I was worried about too, right? It was that whole idea of how he defined cosets. I still have not made any sense of that. I can't believe it took me this many years to notice that. But buried in there is this really weird definition of cosets. And, you know, I'm beginning to think, how can I possibly be critical of Gilmore? It may be that with Lee groups themselves, given the compatibility requirements, as, as they're called, evidently, it could be that the way he defines it is completely legit for for uh, Lee groups. It could be that for every, every, I guess you would have to say this way, every Lee group, for, for, for Gilmore's sense of what a coset is, every Lee group... Um, uh, must have as a subgroup um, its own uh, uh, quotient groups. All the quotient groups you can get out of a Lie group must also be a subgroup of the Lie group. And maybe that's true for Lie groups somehow, and I just don't see it. I mean, he certainly doesn't say that. He, he makes it sound like this is like a general rule for groups. But he might mean that it's just for Lee groups. But if so, I've never seen a proof of that. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, Jimmy, just take your time. I mean, there's no rush, right? Unless, unless uh, I mean, I don't. I certainly don't rush to make the lessons, so you shouldn't be any rush to, 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 to cover them. But, but do make sure that you either you find another source of material. It doesn't even have to be Gilmore straight up. It can just be something else. But make sure that you're you're using a real textbook by a real author. Um, you know, uh, you know that that's a really important thing to do. Uh, it, by the way, can somebody uh, fact check? Is Mister Switchenberg deceased, uh, or or was or was was it? I know we were also talking about Z. Was it Z, was that comment about being deceased? Was that Z or Mister Switchenberg? If somebody could just fact check that for me, I'd appreciate it. Um, how to distinguish if you have a perfunctory knowledge or a deep knowledge of a certain subject. You have a deep knowledge about a certain subject. One hint, Amar, is if it bores you, right? If your familiarity is such that you can't, you can barely stand to think about it anymore, your knowledge is, is getting to be, uh, I, I don't want to say deep. Deep is kind of a weird word, but um, your knowledge is, um, uh, you don't have a thorough knowledge until it kind of, it's kind of anticlimactic to you, right? Um, yeah, yeah, you know, I kind of get the feeling, this book does feel like it was authored by a young author. I, I, I there's an enthusiasm to it about teaching it from this perspective, um, I do feel like this is a youthful author. So even if he's not, he certainly has captured a fascination with the subject. This is a beautifully written book, by the way. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of skipping over that fact. Like, like here, let's look at this paragraph right here. We will see that nature agrees with such lines of thought, exclam. When you see exclams, you know, that's a really good feeling. We're describing elementary particle. One uses the representations of the covering group of the Poincaré group instead of just the usual representation one uses to transform form factors. To describe nature at the most fundamental level, we must use the covering group instead of any other groups that one can map from the covering group. We are able to derive representations. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I got it. I can't help but say that this is really kind of bizarre. I mean, kind of disturb. Uh, he's using footnotes to make a statement that is essentially a parenthetical, right? This belongs in a parenthesis, not a footnote, really, uh, because the footnote is just too distracting, right? He just wants to say, in fact, he does, it doesn't even need to be a parenthetical. It can just be stated. We are able to derive these. We are able to derive the representations of the most fundamental group belonging to a given Lie, given Lie algebra 
by deriving representations of the lead algebra. This notion will be made more precise in the next session. Right? There's really no need to set, set that out. It's an important idea because what he's basically saying here is, what I'm saying you don't understand and aren't expected to understand, be expected to understand. Well, if that's the case, you just gotta say that, right? You, you don't wanna, you don't want to distract the reader by breaking up their attention between the text and a parenthetical. You just say it. Just say it. Although we're not in a position to understand this yet, we can derive these representations soon, right? And then herein lies the strength of Lie theory. By using pure mathematics, we are able to reveal something fundamental about nature. The standard symmetry group of special relativity hides something from us because it is not the most fundamental group belonging to, uh, see, I'm having trouble with my camera here, belonging to this symmetry. The covering group of the Poincaré group is the fundamental group, and therefore we will use it to describe nature. Now, let me tell you, as somebody who fully understands what he's saying here, that is beautiful. He's definitely nailed it, and you definitely can see that he feels the profundity of this himself. I'm not so sure that the target, sorry about moving around like this. I'm not so sure that the target undergraduates are going to catch that. They're definitely going to catch that it's profound. But the details why, you know, he's got a little chart here. You know, 1 to 1, U2 to SU2, 2 to 1, SU2 to SO3. SU2 is the distinguished group belonging to the Lie algebra because S3 is simply connected. What? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I see, I see, I see, I see what he's saying. Yeah, of course, SU2 is... Um, Remember the whole. Remember that whole thing. We did this in the in the in the in our lectures, right? We showed how SU two could be mapped onto S three, and S three is simply connected. So, um, so, ergo, SU two is the universal covering group, and SO three you could not do that. In SO three you could not unwind part of the homotopy group, and so you 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 couldn't pull it off, and so it's not simply connected. There were there was the the was it a homology group? The homology group is uh, is not is not the identity. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but boy, this is an advanced concept here, and I and I just don't think I, I just don't think he's up. The, the explanation is 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 going to take a student into the confidence zone on this. But um, but then he begins representation theory. So presumably here's where he starts to explain things that should unravel what he's laid out in the previous section. Oh yeah, I keep thinking I keep saying I was going to check into the stuff on the manifolds. Let me let me do that. Let me go back linear algebra, calculus, vector calculus. His appendices are quite deep actually, starting with vector calculus. All right, that's See vector calculus I don't think if you're hitting this book and you're doing vector calculus, you're in the wrong class, right? Vector calculus is learned in basic electromagnetism. That's where you learn your cross product. Your, I'm sorry, your um, your curl, your divergence. You uh, you learn the, the identities for the curl and divergence and the gradient operators. Uh, you do the coordinate transformation stuff. It's all in fundamental electromagnetism. It's a great course. I loved every second of it. It's so you shouldn't really need a vector calculus. Um, uh, you know, look, look. He's got he's got a calculus refresher in the back here with the with the doggone product rule. That that's crazy, right? You, you don't integration by parts. Um, no, nobody reading this book should need this. What, what, what you could do is you could do an extra chapter on manifolds, right? You can get rid of all of this, you know, uh, splitting sums and, and all of this. You can get rid of all of this, every bit of this. And uh, I mean, look, proving Euler's formula. No, that, that's the, all, every piece of paper I'm turning now should have been dedicated to some other subject, right? Um, 
linear algebra, uh, basic transformations. Sorry, um, I'm trying to find the part about manifolds, right? Maybe let, let me take it away from the camera here. Hold on a second. Let me take it away from the camera. Uh, additional mathematical notions. Uh, where the heck? Delta distribution, delta function. Where, where is this thing on manifolds? You promised manifolds somewhere. Uh, I better go. Let me go to the. Let me go to the. Um, I'm going to the uh, title, uh, the table of contents. I thought I could just find it. Fourier transformation, matrix exponentials, linear algebra, calculus, Taylor series, vector calculus. I swear he said we're talking about manifolds in the appendix. I know he said that. Did, did I read that wrong? Let me let me go back here. We're going to find it. Generalization of the Lie algebra of SU2. Uh, maybe, I, maybe I read it wrong. Um, uh, uh, for some more information about manifolds, see the appendix in section 3.11 at the end of the chapter. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, so he has something at the end of the chapter. What does he say at the end of the chapter? Um, it's... Uh, Section 3.11, section 3. Point, so I'm jumping ahead here to 3.11, 3 3.76, 3 3.78, 3.9. Okay, not many pages left here, but okay. Here's their appendix for manifolds. All right, so appendix manifolds. A manifold is a set of points with a continuous one-to-one -one map from each open neighborhood. Okay, so onto an open set of Rn, all right? You know, fair enough, right? I suppose uh, an undergrad should know what an open neighborhood is, right? Right? I don't know. I mean, do you know topology enough to know what exactly an open neighborhood is? Um, in easy words... This means that a manifold looks locally like the standard Rn. In easy words, I've never seen, I've never seen that expression in easy words. I don't know. I'd like, I'd like my book in all easy words, please. Right? You know. First of all, I don't think the first sentence was that hard words. I don't think those were hard words, right? I think the first sentence was actually pretty easy words. But that does show that he already believes that you probably don't know what an open set is because he feels the needs to make need to make those easy words, whatever that is. Uh, an example of a manifold is an n-ball. You know, I'm not sure that. Um, okay, so this entire set of paragraphs. So so that's how long it is, right? It's it's about ten paragraphs, right? And he, he, basically, he exemplifies a manifold with a sphere, right? This is not edifying enough at all. In fact, this is not much more than the parenthetical he had, not the parenthetical, the footnote that he had back here in um, when he introduced the idea, which was back. Uh, uh, where was it? Where was it? Where was it? Um, back where? Well, back where, we, where he referenced the appendix, right? Yeah, here in this abstract definition, this this parenthetical here, right? That parenthetical is a TLDR version of the appendix that he refers to in three point one one, and the TLDR captures everything in there without easy words, I guess. I don't know, but it's not good enough. It's definitely not good enough, and it can't be right. I mean, it's not. It's not really his fault, right? It's just not doable. Okay, so anyway, now let's have a look. Representation theory. Um, representation theory, uh, this is, so this is where we might start, right? We might jump into this right here because we've, we've actually done everything before this already. So I, in fact, I think the last two lectures I left off with were representation theory. So let's let's now look at this book from brand new eyes and say, okay, 
if we were going to take a small digression into representation theory, would we use this book? Um, for theoretical considerations, it's often useful to regard any group as an abstract group. This means defining the group by its manifold structure and group operation. Um, well, okay, so any group as an abstract group, certainly true, but not every group has a manifold structure, right? Every group has a group operation, but, he, you know, look, the sentence says any group as an abstract group, he meant any Lie group as an abstract group because only Lie groups have manifold structures that are compatible with its group operation. So that's a little sloppy. For for example, SU2 is a three is a three sphere, is the three sphere. The elements of the group are points on the manifold, and the rule associating the product with any two points satisfies the group axioms. In physical applications, one is more interested in what the group actually does, the group action. Um, okay, so, you know, look, I, I'm, I'm not blown away by that paragraph. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I guess I'm just, as a person who knows this stuff, I'm trying to imagine myself if I don't know this stuff and I'm reading this, right? And to say SU2 is the three sphere, look, that's that's really not a good way of saying it, and it may actually just be wrong, right? I mean, SU2 as a group, right, has the manifold structure that's the same as a three sphere does, right? That's fair. SU2 is not the three sphere, right? It, SU2 is a group and the three sphere is S3. Those are different things. The points on a manifold three sphere can be given coordinates. The group SU2, every element can be given coordinates. It just so happens that those coordinates are in fact uh, both applied to a manifold that is isomorphic that's or, or diffeomorphic, right? It's the same manifold. So every element of FU2 can be given the same coordinates as every point on the sphere. But SU2 is not the sphere. SU2 is a group. A sphere is a sphere, right? They're different mathematical ideas. The fact that you can give SU2 the same coordinates as a three sphere is very important, but they're not the same. And so to say it is, is wrong. And also the comma should have been after for example. For example, comma, SU2 is the three sphere. And then the elements of the group are points of the manifold and the rule associating a product point AB with any two points B and A satisfies the group axiom. So what they're trying to say there, what he's trying to say is that the coordinates of, so SU2 has the structure of a manifold, therefore every point in SU2 has coordinates. Ergo, you can take, you can find a rule that takes the coordinates of a group and return the group the, the, actually you can find a rule that takes the coordinates of any two points right you take two elements of SU2 find the coordinates of those two elements and just by operating on the coordinates you should be able to get the coordinates of another element of SU2 and that element of SU2 should be the same as you would have gotten had you taken the two elements of SU2 in the first instance and run the group operation and found the coordinates of that right that's the whole compatibility thing so that's all true, right? Now, what he's then saying is sort of a non sequitur, right? So he's done explaining the fact of how the compatibility, he's basically done restating the compatibility rule here. And then he, I guess what he's saying is, yeah, yeah, you can do that, but usually we don't care about that. But we care about what the group actually does, the group action, right? So. Yeah, fair enough. But the point is, is you can't, the, the group action is a concept in group theory. And it's something that I think we should talk about in our class on representation theory. And I'm, that's probably the next lesson is going to be to go back to the idea of a group action. 
which we already talked about a lot, right? We talk, we've already talked about the idea that every element of the Lie group can be considered as not only a member of a group, but also as a thing, a tool that acts on an, a vector space. But this is the first time he's ever mentioned group action, right? Because his group action is this is a subject of group theory, right? That you know any elementary group theory book usually talks about a group action and then talks about like the orbit stabilizer theorem. But of course he didn't do that. So introducing the notion of a group action is a, diver is a diversion now, but I guess that's what this next section is about. An important idea is that one group can act on many different kinds of objects. 72, this will make much more sense in a moment. See, he's stuck with this. He's got this pattern, right? And this is this this is the third is this the third time or maybe I'm exaggerating maybe it's the second time but whenever you have to say just keep going it'll all make sense in a second you can get away with that once or twice for a certain topic but that's like becoming a habit here right I'm about to say things that make no sense but don't worry stick with me I don't know that's not a good way to write a book um the idea motivates the definition of a representation. A representation is a map between any group element G of a group G and a linear transformation RG of some vector space V. I hope he defined vector space earlier here. I'm not going to go hunt it down, but I have a funny feeling he didn't. But uh, uh, we should, I should check. I should, I should check before I say that. Um, in such a way that the group properties are preserved, meaning, meaning that the uh, the the linear transformation associated with the group identity element is just the identity transformation. The linear transformation associated with the inverse element is the inverse linear transformation associated with the original element, right? Fair enough. I mean, that's all, of course, critical. This is all compatibility stuff, right? And the the composition of two linear transformations is equal to the linear transformation associated with the group composition, right? That's, this is all compatibility, right? So a representation identifies with each point or abstract group element of the group manifold, a linear transformation of the vector space. Yeah, we, we talked about all this. This is very important stuff. Also, we can define a representation as a map. Most of the time we will call a set of matrices a representation. Right, so the idea is a linear transformation on a vector space can frequently be, or if not typically is, um, represented as matrices. So uh, the representation is frequently thought of as a map from the group to uh, essentially the general linear group of the vector space. And the representation is usually thought of as the map itself, right? That's what these R's are. These R's are mappings from the group to the general linear group of the vector space. And that general linear group of the vector space is frequently, if not almost always, considered to be a group of matrices. Um, right, so his habit seems to be, here's another example of, it's basically the same problem, right? For example, the usual rotation matrices are a representation of the group SO3 on the vector space R3. So here he says vector space, marginal note 76. I'm not even going to call them marginal notes. They're really footnotes. They're just thrown on the margin. Um, uh, R3, okay, so what could, what could this 76 possibly be? I bet, I haven't read it yet, but I bet it's the definition of something in that very sentence, and the sentence will make no sense unless you do it. 76, um, here it is. R3 denotes the three-dimensional Euclidean space where elements are ordinary three-component vectors as we will use them, for example, in Appendix A. Okay, yeah, so clearly he's defining R3 in a footnote, right? This ex <laughs> Okay, all right. The, the point is, is this, this column of footnotes is, it shouldn't be, the, nothing here should be important for understanding. This should all be just to clarify or enhance or uh, provide a footnote for a reference 
or uh, alert the reader to a common confusion that might appear, right? That's what this should be. And in fact, even some of those should be in the text itself. But in order to make the text brief, he's trying to throw stuff in these marginal notes. So um, the rotation matrix are linear transformations on R3. However, the important thing here is that we can examine the group action on other vector spaces too. Using representation theory, we are able to investigate systematically how a given group acts on very different vector spaces, and that is where things start to get interesting. And actually, that's where this is getting interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how he's going to explain this. I think that is a good point. And, and highlighting that, that is a good thing to highlight, is, is that may not be an obvious fact. You know, representation theory is very dry, and to point this out is a good idea. One of the most important examples in physics is SU2. For example, we can examine how SU2 acts on the complex vector space of dimension of the dimension C1, right? So like one complex dimension, which is especially easy as we'll see later. We can also investigate how SU2 acts on a vector space of two complex dimensions. The objects living in C2 are complex vectors of dimension two, and therefore SU2 acts on them as two by two matrices. The matrices equals linear transformations, right? That's sort of an AKA there. Um, that sign equals I think is not a good, I wouldn't have done that. Yeah, I know what he's trying to say. He's like, matrices are also to be understood as linear transformations. That's fair enough, but, um, but uh, anyway, the matrices acting on C2 are just the usual SU2 matrices that we already know. In addition, we can examine how SU2 acts on C3 and even higher dimensional vector spaces. There is a well-defined framework for constructing such representations, and as a result, SU2 acts, for example, on complex vectors of dimension three as three by three matrices. A basis for SU2, a basis for the SU2 generators when they act on C3 is given by these matrices here. And here he's presenting these three. And then of course, 77, what do you think this says? We will learn later in this chapter how to derive these. At this point, just take notice that it is possible, right? Um, in that case, I, I think he kind of, he didn't have to say, I, mean, I think it was pretty clear already that they were demonstrations. As usual, we can compute matrices that represent elements of the group SU2 by putting linear combinations of these generators into the exponential function. Um, Okay, all right. One can go on and inspect how SU2 acts on higher dimensional vectors. This can be quite confusing, and it would be better to call this group S3 instead of SU2 because usually SU2 is defined on the set of complex 2x2 two two matrices satisfying this definition. He wants to call this group S3. I've never quite... Uh, in an early draft version of this book, the group was consequently called S3. Unfortunately, such a non-standard name makes it hard for beginners. Yeah, I was about to say, wait a minute, why would you call this group S3? <laughs> so there's a couple problems. First of all, there's the grammar problem, right? Call should mean you're naming it, and naming is using a symbol as a symbol. So you're referring to S3 not as the group, but as the symbol to name the group. So you should have quotes. That's my opinion. Um, you've got the you've got the footnote that is not separated from the word sufficiently, so that's a problem. And then you've got uh, you're basically asserting that your own choice of name is confusing. I don't know. I, I would not have done this. <laughs> I wouldn't have done this. I mean, I don't have an editor, but I, I wouldn't have gone down this road. I guess the idea is to be sort of uh, less formal, right? You want to be less formal. Say, hey, look, I wrestled with this idea of calling this group S3. Um, I'm not even sure S, I don't see how you could ever call it a, a group S3 at all. I, I just, S3 is a sphere. It's already got a thing. It's already naming something. And it's literally a manifold and it's not a group at all. It's it's a manifold. It's a It's a, it's a sphere, right? Anyway, um, so 
All right, so I'm going to back up a bit. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm definitely becoming increasingly critical. It's it, what uh, games and thoughts. I'm kind of going back to your. Uh, the ambition here is very, very high. And the question is, is did he accomplish his ambition? Has he produced a, a book that undergraduates can use to really lean into this theory? My opinion is it is better to learn something narrow well and feel like you own it than to kind of gloss over a bunch of things. Um, so, you know, if I were an undergraduate and I was going to devote my time to learning about symmetry, I would just focus on one subject here. Uh, anyway, I mean, he has the same pro. He has the he has the all the problems here that led me to do my lectures, which is to flush out things, and I'm flushing out things because of books like this that kind of touch on things. I did what is a manifold because nobody actually covers manifolds, and this book is no different in that regard. Um, the one key difference, I suppose, is that, well, not it's not different, but the advantage he has is that general relativity, you really do need to know what manifolds are and how they work. Um, this subject, Lee groups, you can probably get away without it, without formally defining a manifold. Um, but he chose not to. He, he, he threw manifold right down in that definition and then really hasn't defined manifolds, which is a problem. Um, uh, so Vic, as Dirac said, people don't understand math. They just get used to it. You know, I don't think he said that. I think he said that about quantum mechanics, um, right? Uh, I think he specifically said you do get used to quantum mechanics, which is a subject I totally agree with, right? When you learn quantum mechanics, you're struggling to climb this mountain and, and basically interpret this. And you can, and the way I like to present it, and if I ever do a course on it, I will, is axiomatically. You assume these core axioms. Here's how you do all the calculations. After you feel good about that, then you're eligible. You're qualified to go back and start talking about the interpretation and start understanding what it's all about. But I don't think he said that about math in general. I thought I my first of all, it may be apocryphal that he said it at all, but I thought he said it about quantum mechanics specifically. Um, uh, yeah, Srikar, I, I'm kind of wrapped up in this. You're right, I'm kind of crawling through it. Um, my bad, yeah, I'll go a little faster. All right, sorry. <clears throat> Saying it is a fundamental group is a misuse of mathematical language. Um, where did he say that, uh, Madave? Uh, is, are you talking about something that I read in here? Um, uh, actually, I, actually, I think I know what you said. I think I know what you're referring to. You're referring to uh, distinguished group? No, no, he used the word distinguished here not fundamental. Did he ever use the word fundamental group in this? I don't think so. Simply connected. Uh, maybe I missed it. Uh, um, which book do you have by Spivak? His Calculus on Manifolds book. I love going through. I think I have that one. Yeah, I'm looking at Calculus on Manifolds. That's the one I have. Um, uh, I don't think I've read it, though. I, I mean... He's constantly referred to by everybody on it. I feel like I got my calculus on manifolds down pretty well, so I've never felt like I needed to kind of dig into that. Um, you know, uh, uh, but yeah, he's the, like, that's, Spivak is like the common reference for all of this stuff. I probably should get this other one though, Comprehensive Introduction to Differential Geometry. Um, uh, if, he, if that book has a proof, what I don't want is I don't want a book on classical differential geometry. I have a book on classical elementary differential geometry, and I never really studied it too much. I mean, I did the basics, but I never really, I didn't really pour through the whole thing for sure. Um, 
I don't want another book on classical differential geometry. On the other hand, if he has a proof about this particular uh, distinct, if he has a proof, I guess, what does it say here? Um, there's pr precisely one distinguished Lie group for each Lie algebra. I'm not sure that I prove that, but, so I'd like to see that. Um, so maybe I should buy this book, uh, Comprehensive Introduction to Differential Geometry. Hopefully it's general enough. I'm gonna put that on my list of things to buy with the Patreon money that you guys have so graciously uh, given to me. I have, I have enough to buy, you know, like this book, right? Do you regret buying this book? I would have, you know, I don't regret buying this book. Um, because like I said, when, when you understand it, it actually is a very nice tight presentation of things. And uh, I have yet to fully, I wanna see, I'm sure that he does a good job of talking about how all this stuff applies to quantum mechanics, uh, elementary quantum mechanics, and I wanna see that. Um, by the way, the latex class used is cow book. Unfortunately, this class is a pain when it comes to formatting, hence many errors if the author is not used to latex. Oh, really? Are you able to tell Ildog what version of latex he used? I've never heard of cow book. I just use AMS latex. And I certainly know that, you know, <laughs> those lines can be done better. Also, the notes on the side are side notes, not footnotes. Footnotes ex also exist in the class and would be found below the text, bottom line. Cow I like I like the side notes. I'm going to call them footnotes just because, you know, they're basically just, it's just a matter of where they are as far as I can tell. But I just don't, I just don't um, think he's, he sometimes does use it well, right? Like here he says, like here's a good example of one that's done well. Uh, this picture is a bit oversimplified, he writes. Strictly speaking, SO3 as a manifold is still a sphere, but with antipodal points identified. See, that's true. We went through that in deep detail, right? That's a profound and interesting subject, right? The two-dimensional slice of the sphere which is three-dimensional surface, we can see the top half of the sphere because we get from SU2 to SO3, we identify the two points, blah, 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 with each other. Um, I, 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 look, I don't think, the idea of these antipodal points being identified is a very tricky concept. And it's an important concept and it's a tricky concept. If you're not gonna go 100%, you don't go at all, right? In some sense, the only reason that this footnote appears here is I think he's worried that somebody who reads this text, who knows what he's talking about, will think like, well, doesn't the author understand this point? Or that's not really specifically, or he's worried, he's worried that somebody like me is gonna come along, some jerk like me, and I'm definitely being a jerk here. Um, uh, we can think of SO3 as the top half of S3, right? And he's going, well, you know, somebody who knows what he's, what, it, what, what, if somebody who knows the subject is going to say, well, that doesn't, that's not right. So he throws in a footnote for the people who actually know just to prove to the people who know that he knows he's not making a mistake, right? <laughs> it's not helping any new learner at all, right? So he's covering himself a little bit here. Um, yeah, so anyway, um, uh, anyway, apart from the book, you have a plan of starting with representation. Okay, good. Cause I'm going to do it. I've decided fully to do it now. I, uh, Jimmy Odom writes, I like this book. It seems very helpful for a new entrant to the field, such as myself, a stopgap between your lectures and a hi-fi book. Yeah, this is a great book. If you're reading my, if you're watching my lectures and you have this book, you're in good shape. Yeah, I agree. Um, because I fill in all the gaps that I'm complaining about are missing here. That's the point. My lectures would be a good supplement for something like this. My lectures would not stand on their own. Um, and this book, I think, has is got, is got fill-in gaps for whatever reason. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that's right, Jimmy. Um, uh, yeah, no, I think that's right, Jimmy. I think I think exactly what you're saying is true. Fermat said long goes margin is not big enough. <laughs> what is the what is the uh, final assessment on that? I guess we all decided that whatever Fermat's proof was was probably wrong. Salvik, I'm curious if you may know something about that. 
I'm curious if anybody, I was thinking about this just the other day. I'm curious if anybody out there has ever come up with a theory of what Fermat thought was a good proof. Obviously, nobody knows what his proof was, but what proof do people think Fermat was most likely to have mistakenly thought was a proof? Um, uh, does anybody, uh, Savik, are you aware of anybody who's speculated about that in some intelligent way, you know, based on what Fermat knew at the time, what he was thinking about at the time or something like that? Later in the chapter, we'll drive these. Later in the chapter, this is left as an exercise on section 422, derive this. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I do get the idea that there is a, a value of saying, here's what I'm going to teach you. We're going to learn about representation theory. Here's the gist of it. We're going to get into it in a moment. That makes some sense. I, so uh, the problem is when you literally assert things in sentences that you that you have to say don't make sense right and it will later you can you can introduce things and you know with the global understanding you know here's what we're going to learn we're going to learn how to do this we're going to learn how to, and then you would never have to say anything like you're mentioning uh Dennis, uh later in the chapter right I've read all the applications part of this book and it was better, though I do have a strong mathematical background, so I might be biased. Yeah, you know, look, it, no, nothing is better than reading a book that you know all the answers to, right? Right, especially applications, because with application, if you understand the math, applications, you're not really learning anything, right? You're, you know, if you know partial differential equations solid, studying the, uh, wave equation for an electromagnetic system, you are getting more exercise with partial I mean, yeah, you are doing a one-to-one -one mapping of the mathematics to the modeling of physics. So you are learning physics, don't get me wrong. That's You are learning physics. You can know a lot of PDEs and know physics, right? But you're gonna get, that physics is not gonna be a big, a big jump for you, right? So yeah, I, I suspect you may be biased, but of course, I'm only just starting here, Alia. Um, Longest unboxing ever. Yeah, I know. I, I, I said that was going to be a problem, Philanda, right? This isn't a guitar, right? It's like, oh, each page. And, and to, be, to, be, to be honest, to be fair, the reason I'm kind of wrapped up in it is I love these subjects. The subject is beautiful. I love the fact that he's talking about representation theory and he's got really well, you know, he's got a, a well thought out layout. You know, he's definitely put a lot of love into this. And so I'm, I'm really excited by reading each one, right? Each little page, like, like here. When, whenever you talk about representation theory, you're gonna inevitably deal with the bugaboo of the irreducible representation, right? An irreducible representation is a representation of a group on a vector space that has no invariant subspaces besides zero and itself. Now look, already you can see right there, I just, irreducible representation is a hard concept you have to come face to face with explaining it. You can't explain it without understanding what an invariant subspace is, right? But boy, boom, 83. I'm deeply suspicious that 83 is going to be a critical definition that is mandatory for the understanding. So let's check it out. The subspace consisting solely of the identity element is always trivial in invariant subspace. Okay, see, I. I did not see that coming, but that's even worse, right? Because if you understand an invariant subspace, right, you know that uh, the identity is an invariant subspace and the whole group is an invariant subspace. You know that, right? It, it, you've already said invariant subspace besides the zero space in Z itself. Writing, the, repeating that, this is literally a repetition of a statement in here, right? You're much better off doing the other mistake, which is writing a sentence that defines invariant subspace in the margin, right? In this case, you might say, as a reminder from group theory, 
an invariant subspace is defined as one where its left cosets and right cosets are the same or something like that. Just defining an invariant subspace. That was what I was expecting 83 to be, right? You know, you're talking about Lie groups. That's a sophisticated subject. You've got to assume group theory. He obviously doesn't assume group theory. He defined groups theory in the most perfunctory way possible. He, does, he just defined a group. So he never talked about what an invariant subspace was. But this sentence clearly assumes the reader knows. And then it r repeats the point that, that that's a, that that's, makes no sense, right? Um, such representations can be thought of as truly fundamental because they are not made up of smaller representations. So, you know, here's a little thing, right? Truly is a word that could have been left out, right? I mean, are we talking about things that are pretending to be fundamental but aren't and so we have to distinguish these as truly fundamental we have we never talked about the fact that reg, representations in general each claim to be somehow fundamental right so so truly is like it, it's 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 a really bad word there because i know it seems like such a small thing but represent uh, irreducible representations can be considered as funda as more fundamental or as fu as fundamental in the sense that all representations are built up. They're the atomic pieces of all representations. That's the point you want to make. Just say it. You don't have to say like these are the truly fundamental ones as opposed to others that are faux fundamental or, you know, anyway. The irreducible representations of a group are the building blocks from which we can build up all other representations, right? That's the that's sort of the point, right? So that, you know, yeah. So there's an extra whole sentence in there, right? He should have gotten rid of the sentence and then talked more about manifolds. Is there another way to think about irreducible representation? The irreducible representation cannot be rewritten using a similar similarity transformation in block diagonal form. In contrast, a reducible representation can be rewritten in block diagonal form through similarity transformations. These notions are important because we will use irreducible representations to describe our elementary particles. We will later see that the behavior of elementary particles under transformations is described by irreducible representations of the corresponding symmetry group. I'm, I'm almost scared to read these footnotes at this point. As an example of the matrix in block diagonal form is, okay. You know what's really funny about this is that undergraduate quantum mechanic books address this in deep detail and they really struggle with trying to explain irreducible representations. They, there's lots of matrix pictures and, you know, inevitably when you do uh, when you do perturbation theory, you're constantly wrestling with uh, uh, ir uh, reducible matrices and 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 uh, degeneracies. It's a really important idea. I'm uh, presuming, I'm hoping and expecting that this will be re, re approached again. There are many possible representations for each group. How do we know which one describes nature? There is, there is an idea based on the Casimir elements. A Casimir element, C, is built from the generators of Lie algebra and its defining feature is that it commutes with every generator of the group. What does this mean? See, so throwing in that question, what does this mean? It's another way that the author is saying that I've explained to you something that I expect that when you read it, you're going to be so confused that you're going to be asking yourself, what does this mean? So I'm going to articulate the question that's in your head. And it's just another way of saying that I've said something that you probably don't understand. You can always defeat that if you write correctly. You, you don't have to write that way. You don't have to write by perpetually getting ahead of your readers, acknowledging that, and then either blowing it off to the future or, you know, coming back to address it, right? I, I think that's, I think that's just, that's just bad. A famous lemma called Schur's lemma, okay, another missing parenthetical, and then thrown by a footnote, a basic result of group theory, which you can look up in any book about group theory, right? Mm -hmm. An introduction to tensors and group theory for physicists. There's so many books that have that sort of title. I, I Even Herman Weil wrote a book 
uh, didn't he write like group theory and quantum mechanics or something? <laughs> anyway, um, uh, tells us that if we have an irreducible representation, which is, and now here he's going back to the idea that R is the representation and it's a map from Oh, really? Okay. Wait a minute. Did did he talk about representations of the Lie algebra yet? He talked about representations of the Lie group, right? Did he talk about representations of the Lie algebra? No, he talked about representations of a group. Do you, you see the problem here? This is a representation. G is its Gothic form. That's the Lie algebra. So this is the Lie algebra going to the general linear group on vector spaces. So this is the, the, the algebra representation. Right? I, I think he got ahead of himself here again, right? Th this is... Cashmere element is built from generators of the Lie algebra. That's definitely correct, right? But now we are dealing with an irresistible. Now, but he's not really talked about the algebra's representation. Because back here, when he defined representations, right, up here, this is a, a representation of G on V, right? He's never dis there's two different kinds of representations. There's representations for the group and representations for the algebra. And the reason this is important is the group representations use group multiplication or matrix multiplication to simulate group multiplication. Representations for the algebra actually have an addition. Matrix addition is an allowed property and commutation is the group op is the operation. And you know, he's never brought that up. All of a sudden, he's talking about a representation of the algebra. All right, that's a, that's a mess. Is there anything we can say about the vector space V mentioned uh, in the definition of the representation above? An important observation is that it helps us make sense of the vector space, is that for any Lie group, one or several of the corresponding generators can be diagonalized using similarity transformations. In physics, we use these diagonal generators to get labels for the basics vectors that span our vector space. We use eigenvectors of these diagonal generators. The idea is incredibly important and actually understand the physical implications of a given group. This is just one corresponding eigenvalue, several generators. Okay, so the idea is that this book is physics from symmetry, right? I'm going to pause for a second. That's the title of this. And right now, I think you'd be much better off with studying quantum mechanics, right? Quantum mechanics goes, a good quantum mechanics book go through, goes through all of this stuff and does it better. Now, it is, well... I don't know. Maybe, I mean, it, it doesn't do it exactly this way. This did emphasize the algebraic stuff. Let me see what you guys are thinking. I don't know. Um, uh, Spivak has a five series book on modern differential geometry. Really? Should I get all five? How much would that cost? <laughs> uh, this is the book I recommended. I found it to be a good introduction. I'm a self learner, so I've used other books. I'm a little surprised, Tom. I bet you know more than you think. If you found this book very, very useful um i'm i'm actually uh uh you know look i've just started i'm i'm, I'm on page 55 so uh but but um i'm not seeing it to be at this point anything much better than a typical quantum mechanic books like he's about to do representation theory i can i can just by flipping the pages ahead i know exactly how he's doing it he's using raising and lowering operators he's going to uh describe uh uh, the diagonal uh, matrix element J3, the cashmere operator. He's going to identify the representations with eigenvalues of the cashmere operator. He's going to build the matrix elements. This is absolutely standard in quantum mechanics books. And in fact, the amount of time it's taking him to do it, I'm now looking at page 61 here. Right, You can see it right here, right? 
he at this point, in order to get through this, he's doing it at exactly the same rate you would have to do it in a quantum mechanics book because this material has all been very efficiently packaged, right? So I'm going to be on the lookout for insightful differences that make this special, um, Tom. But I do appreciate the recommendation. I do love it. I mean, I do like the book. I mean, I, I, I am going to go through the whole thing. Uh, but... Uh, just because he's calling it Lee Group Theory, in the end, he's just producing the standard material so far that, I'm sorry for the noise, uh, that I've seen in regular quantum mechanics textbooks, right? There, um, now, now here he does a section, the Lorentz Group 013. This is gonna di start to diverge. This is where, if he does well, he's gonna make his money because now he's going to get us into the field theory and the particle theory stuff, so. So uh, representations of the Lorentz group are not typically taught. So hopefully it's all going to be there. Um, Spivis comprehended introduction to differential volume, drama's five volume series. So is this your own written book? If you're talking to me, no. Um, it's called The Method of Infinite Descent. I think from only wanting to make others jealous. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, I, well, I don't know anything about th these people. I mean, I'm sure they were just as, well, I have nothing to say about Fermat and jealousy. Um, uh, man, at, man, you enjoy books like Demystified series. Don't you think it shows your double standard here in this book, which is also trying to distill ideas? Well, uh, yeah, except the demystified series, I really do think that if you read it, first of all, I mean, look, they are what they are. Uh, all these books are written by people who care about the subject and are trying their very best to produce something that uh, they feel like approaches it in a way that is edifying, right? And, and I'm the same way. I mean, I've written a couple books. And I've, I've claimed the same thing. I've reread my own work and I'm absolutely shamed and shocked at what I thought was edifying and what a mess it is. For example, in my, my book, Why Does It Move?, which is about general relativity, it was all about sort of really getting into what these sort of warp space diagrams are and, and how they work and stuff. And I have a section in there about for, uh, visualizing the fourth dimension. And when I wrote that, I was like, man, nobody's written this before. This is like a really good effort at trying to help people visualize the fourth dimension. And I've reread it several times since then. And it's and, and basically what I've done is I've put in one place a lot of little clever things, but I don't think I've packaged it in a truly, truly revolutionary edifying form, which is kind of what I thought I was doing when I first did it. So I'm probably going to be rewriting that, right? Um, but the thing is, when you write a book with a real publisher, you've got to go to press, right? I never have to go to press. So it's easy for me to to say this could be better, or this could be better, because it always could be better. But the demystified, like, look, I'm going to quantum field theory demystified, right? I, I have it right here in my hand. And, um, you know, basically... Basically, the book lays out the, the, the what the guy does is he lays out the basic things, provides strong examples, works through standard problems and and just uh, distills it down and 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 provides some very practical techniques. You know, it's not a problem book either, but. Now, I have the same problem that some people in the chat have, right? I know the subject, right? So for a guy who knows the subject, this is like, oh, wow, this is really well arranged. But if you don't know the subject, I, you know, it seems to me like it's, yeah, you would need to use it in conjunction with something else. I don't feel like Mr. the author, Mr. McMahon, presumed that this would be a textbook in quantum field theory. But... Um, uh, but right here, the point is, is this guy does think that this is a whole new approach, but it, it's, 
like I said, I, I mean, it's I'm I'm still not uh, I'm still not on board uh, with with any particular part of it because he's it's paid 65 and he's done a lot of ground but he's done none of the ground in great depth right and that's i feel like that's probably not a good idea well it was while i was reading this book that i found your channel and maybe that's a result of my not understanding it well <laughs> well you know you know it, it's you I, it depends the my a good question for you tom would be where at what point did you kind of like, hey, you know what? I want to. I, I need to dig into this to see if I can figure it out a little more. Try to find that first point where you derailed a little bit and let me know. I'd be curious to see at what point you felt like uh, I'm a. I, I sh the author is presuming that I'm learning more than I am. Uh, this book is for physicists, so expecting too much mathematical rigor is a bit too much. Fair enough, uh, but. Um, the problem is that but there again but that's the problem then in some sense we we've got to decide what gap is this book filling and as you can see right here this material is totally standard material for any quantum mechanics book right so but of course a quantum mechanics book is going to go on and exploit it and use it and cover it in great depth there's not, I'm not sure quite what the reasoning is to do it cursory. I suppose what he's trying to show is here's how we develop the representations, and that's the big deal for him. So now he's going to go to the representations of um, the Lorentz group. Let's, let's just go on a little bit more here. That This is, to me, like, uh, you know, fertile ground for stuff. Um I, you know, I'm doing most of this just for my own checking it out. The fact that I'm streaming it, I think, is just more of my effort to see if I can pull off this streaming. I don't like my camera. I'm sure you guys don't either. But I'll get it. I'll come up with a better way of doing these things later. So here we have one representation of the Lorentz group. This is um, talking about how to write boosts. In this way, I wonder, is this a, is this the one half, one half representation here he's doing? Let's see. I mean, one thing that w is really good is if he goes into the different core representations of the Lorentz group, that would be terrific. Like right here, he's doing your standard boosts, you know, the hyperbolic functions for the boosts with the rotations. It, this is good, you know, where... He's actually deriving the actual group um, matrix elements for this. Uh, I guess this is a uh, two by two matrix representation, or he's just working on the two by two part of the matrix. Um, and then he talks about the Lie algebra of this thing. And that's where we start learning our stuff, right? Um, it says here, instead, by deriving the irreducible representation of the complexified Lie algebra of the Lorentz group, we find irreducible representations of the covering group of the Lorentz group. Well, I'm just kind of cruising through it now. Uh, I have a funny feeling that that's over the head of most of the readers at this point. But here now we get the zero, the one half zero representation, right? So that I'm going to read pretty carefully, and I think we'll probably be presenting that in our We'll pro I'll probably use this very book. Shoot, why is it the camera's getting all fuzzy again? I'll probably use this very book to, um, come on. I gotta work on this autofocus. I'll use this book to do this representation theory of the Lorentz group, because um, I, do, I do like the way he's doing it. And then this is really great, because I think this is, this is using the van der Weerden notation um, you know, coming up with the left and right spinners, really important because you can't build the standard model until you've done this, until you've kind of gone into the vial spinners and broke them up like that and then launched into this van der Weerden notation, which is really beautiful. Let's see if he's got some in here, right? Yeah, yeah, like right here, you know, where you start. This is where latex becomes really fun, right? Because you're superscripting 
well, it's fun and annoying at the same time. You're, you're superscripting or you're accenting scripts, right? So you have a dot there, right? <laughs> so it becomes very small. Um, but, uh, you know, coming up with notations for these vial spinners, that, you know, that's really good. That's new, right? This is a new approach. So finally, we're actually in an approach that really kind, kind of is new. And since you're talking just about notation, this is not too difficult to grasp. So let's see how, let me raise this up here so you can actually see. Um, I gotta say, uh, at this point, if, if you're doing notation, like look at this expression here, right? If you're doing this, if you're doing, this is where you've gotta use EXP and brackets, right? Throwing all that crap in an exponent like that, that makes students kind of like, well, uh, 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 that makes you cross-eyed. This should be um, pulled into the argument of an EXP function and cleaned up a lot. Things are just too small because you have you have a fraction in there and look at the two in the fraction, right? right? That's another latex mess because you should always have a gap between the fraction line and what's under it and what's over it too. But it's usually latex screws around with what's under it. That can be dealt with but it's you're demanding a lot you're putting a fraction inside um you're, you're superscripting it all and look at that vector on top of the t that thing for some reason is leaning to the left what's what's that all about right you know it's not doing it over here with the poly matrices right it's just doing it here but that's a, you know you should have been able to see that that this is now the underbrace, that's cool. The underbrace is very helpful. I love using the underbrace stuff. And here you have the dotted dots, you know, but you could have done that. that, that this is, that's sort of a latex fail. Uh, do, 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 let's see. So then we get to the one half, one half representation. Very nice. Uh, spin, spinners in parity is this topic here. So that's important, right? Because you, all this is, he's definitely setting the groundwork so he can build up the standard model, right? Right, so, you know, here he's got, this is now a uh, latex, uh, not latex, uh, Lorentz transformation right here of a full while spinner, right? Nice. And then he demonstrates the representation that it's in. Right, that's cool. Um, and then he shows, you know, we, we're dealing with a direct sum. So this is a reducible representation, right? It's a direct sum of two representations. So he's laid down the foundation for all of that. Uh, charge conjugation, infinite dimensional representations. All right, then the Poincaré group. And then the full algebra of the Poincaré group, which of course is what lets you sort of break everything up into um, our different representations for different particles. Oh, this is nice. Yeah, this is actually pretty advanced, right? When he starts the Paul Lubinsky four vector and all that, this is now an advanced topic that would that he's dropping into an undergraduate curriculum. That's cool, that's fine. But he very quickly rushes into assigning it to uh, elementary particles. That's what he wants to do. He's very excited about this. He even said so in the introduction. And then here's our little sort of sad appendix on manifolds. <laughs> um, all right, well, so that's a good start for this. Um, that's a pretty good start for this. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll look at the rest. I don't want to bug everybody else here. I can't believe 36 of you are still going through this. Do you guys have any uh, opinions on this while, uh, before I, let me just put it up there. Hmm. Oh, I see. I'm too high up now. Now I'm too high. See, so I can't get the whole text down. First of all, do you guys find this to be of any interest? I mean, I'm, I'm kind of going through this. I was going through this more of as a, because I guess because Tom, was it Tom that actually recommended it and he sounded like he was very excited by it and and I'm I'm not 
I'm not quite as down on it as I sound, I guess. I will be reading it, so I will go through it in detail, and I will find the best parts, and I will report back. Um, uh, yeah, I would say, Tom, I'm lo looking at your comment about, um, I definitely know about Lee groups more than I did. I would say that you need to learn about Lee groups, and then you use this book, and you should understand this thing seamlessly. And that's sort of a guide on how well you've kind of got the topics down. The stuff in here should all seem very anticlimactic. I doubt that you could ever go the other way. I doubt that you could ever read this book, feel like you know about lead groups, and then go to some other book and feel through it. Um, I, I think it's the uh, it, it's too patchy. And um, I, I'll tell you what, I'm looking at Modern Quantum Mechanics by Sakurai. And I found, when I was a student, I found that book very difficult. Now, I believe when I read it, it is literally like poetry. It is such an amazingly excellent, excellent book. I just wasn't quite ready for it when I did it. And it's a shame because it's actually an introductory undergraduate textbook, which kind of shows that his view on what an undergraduate should be when you study this subject was a little more than I was when I studied it. But now when I read it, it is poetry. And, um, uh, you know, I, I'm tempted to pull it out. Uh, you know, hold on a second while I go over there and, and get it um, without moving. Can I reach? I have a trouble. My camera's like between me and my Sakurai book. And so I'm going to have to move it. Hold on a second. But like, look, look at this, right? The cover of this book, right, is literally an illustration about the nature of irreducible representations of a group, right? That's what he is saying here. That's what this this represents. This shows a very highly reducible representation, right? Now, does he really focus on literal Lie groups in here? Uh, no, he focuses on the formalism of quantum mechanics and uh, you know, let's see. Um, so the formalism of quantum mechanics, oper th this formalism, that's the poetry. That's that piece is just absolute poet. The whole thing is poetry. This is this is like the Keats of physics. This stuff is so well done. I often wondered, was this translated? Because I know he Sakurai here. Here's Sakurai, right? He died. I think he died as complications from a car accident or something. Really sad. But um, uh, I'm sure he spoke English, and I'm pretty sure he wrote the book in English. Um, yeah, he was here, and it's a high school student in '49. So somehow he. This is the definitive book on just being really a beautiful, beautifully written scientific textbook. Um, but it's but at the same time, you know, it's not totally easy. But here, the theory of angular momentum, right? This part here, he's basically doing Lie groups right here, right? SO3, SU2, and Euler rotations. He doesn't quite say it. To him, that's not what this book is about. Although, you know, look, symmetry and quantum mechanics, right? So it's in there. But I don't think he literally uses the language. Then the rest of the book is applications, right? Uh, and then scattering theory, as I said. For example, any, anybody in here who wants to be doing QED or, or the number one, the Littmann Schwinger equation, you don't know that, you're gonna have a hard time, right? So so QED starts with the Born approximation, Littmann Schwinger equation, all that stuff. That is the framework that you would want to launch into a good QED theory, a, a good QED. That's the foundation you would want. Libman Schwinger equation is literally the kind of, I, I got to remember, there is a way of deriving the, uh, uh, the perturbation series that is ultimately Feynman diagrams. And I'm pretty sure the Lippmann Schwinger equation or is, is, is part of that, is part of that process. It's been a while since I've done it. That should be the lesson I do if I do do it. But anyway, the point is, is if you go into here, um, right, you know, right here, right. First of all, you'll notice right away this book was written before LaTeX, and look at his, look at his commutator, right? 
It's got a nice gap on both sides, right? That, there's, there's no flaws in this book, zero flaws. Um, uh, but, but uh, you know, you, you just, I'm trying to find, uh, where's the angular theory, the theory of angular momentum? Potentials and gauge transformation, right? Right here, that's, that's a whole chapter, potentials and gauge transformations. That's a, a pretty insightful concept to have in a book in the 70s, right? Look, here's, here, he, here he, he does this. This is a fundamental quantum mechanics book. He's already got path integrals and Feynman propagators. So, you know, understanding Green's functions at this level, I, I, I wasn't prepared for it. But you don't have to read that section either, right? A lot of this is very easy to, um, to, to put aside, and you can just go straight into the theory of angular momentum. And here, in the theory of angular momentum, kaboom, right there. This is what Schweinberg is trying to say in a paragraph. And if Sakurai can't say it in a paragraph, then it can't be said in a paragraph, right? Here he, he's got all the same things in here. He's got the rotation group. Um, uh, then he... he he, he does the abstract rotation group right here. This, this is exponentiation. Notice he doesn't jam all this into an exponent. He leaves it right here, right? He, he, he doesn't go E to all of this crap. He uses the EXP, right? Because he knows, you know, who's going to want to read all this stuff jammed up into an exponent, exponential, right? Um, uh, and, and then the... Uh, you know he can derive the commutation relations. Where does he de where does he derive the? Uh, you know, um, uh, two pi rotations. That whole thing about the double cover. Now that's where uh, 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 Schwichtenberg does a really good job. Is he's he's trying to Euclid. Uh, he's trying to express all this in terms of uh, of more fundamental mathematics. Right. That that is true. You know, I, you, I don't think you'll see the word double cover anywhere in uh, Sakurai. And you definitely, I don't think you'll see, you'll see spin one half systems, but you're not going to see the Lorentz group. I mean, here's the, here's the spinner, the two component spinner, right? You see that, but he's not going to go into the Van der Weerde notation. Um, and I don't think he's going to do the two different, uh, he's going to stick with just rotations, right? SU2, SU3, and Euler rotations, right? The orthogonal group. He calls it the orthogonal group. I don't think the word Lie group ever shows up here. But it doesn't have to, right? This is, he doesn't have to use the word manifold, right? You know, you, you don't need the concept of manifold here. And he's, he realizes that if he uses that word, if he says, hey, the orthogonal group is a manifold that has a group property that is compatible with well, no, the Lie group is a group that is diffeomorphic to a manifold in a way that preserves the group property. He realizes how far afield he's going to have to go. So he, he, so they focus on this. So there's a, I guess my point is there's a reason why the physics from symmetry approach is not fully developed yet as a pedagogy, right? It's because of, it's because of all of these problems, right? And now here you see the, the ladder operators, all that stuff that's in there, that's in Schwingberg, it's, it's right here. This book is no, I, I doubt this book is any longer, right? It's, it's just, it's like being good at something. Anyway, I guess comparing a, a textbook to Sakurai is totally unfair, right? Because this is literally the poetry of quantum mechanics right here. God, I'm gonna just, I'm, I'm taking this, I'm taking this to bed tonight. I gotta, I gotta reread it again. Anyway, um, uh, but before we have a final verdict on this, we should obviously finish reviewing it. Um, let me finish up here. I'm just going to quickly catch up in, in chat and then uh, call, it a, call it a stream. Uh, like Salvik mentioned, the current theory on what was Fermat's incorrect proof, it's a proof using a method of infinite descent based on his sketch proofing. Oh, okay, cool. So there is somebody who did that. Nice, nice. I've always wondered that, Alia. Oh, yeah. Thank you for, uh, oh, Salvik said something about that. Um, uh, 
yes about FLT. It's called the method of infinite descent. So we all think that it's very likely that he used the method of infinite descent somehow. I don't know what that is, but I'm now excited to see it because that's cool. I, I think that's just fun. Cool. I'm glad. That's good. I, I've always wondered about that. I've always wondered about that. Is what was he thinking, right? Um, uh, sorry, just joined. What book is this? We were talking about the book you see on the screen, Jacob Switchenberg's Physics from Symmetry. Although if you joined a little bit after that, I was comparing it to modern quantum mechanics. One thing you is is it's the same topics but he doesn't just go in and say we're going to talk about quantum mechanics he kind of steps back and says we're going to talk about the mathematics of Lie groups and then apply it to quantum mechanics the typical way of doing this is learn quantum mechanics and learn what you need to know about continuous groups there and and I see the point I, I see the idea of starting from the other direction and I and I, I'm actually very sympathetic to that um, yeah, so I think it's a good idea. Uh, um, well, thank you, Denise, about the, the stream. It is, I'm definitely, this is my third stream ever, and I'm kind of hacking things together with my camera and the stream thing, and, and I got to find a camera that focuses better. I definitely discovered a weakness in my webcam here, so I'll, I'll I have some Patreon money to, to buy things that would improve this. So I will do that. I will spend that money to improve the stream. Uh, and buy some of these books. I, I'm glad Tom recommended this book. I like this book. Uh, uh, as a person who understands it, I think it will help me organize a way of thinking about these things that's different. I would not recommend it for an undergraduate like it's meant for, which is actually a, a pretty heavy criticism of it, I know. But... Um, but then again, not every book is great in every section, right? We've only done the beginning sections. It could very well be that the later sections are better. In fact, I think, Tom, you suggested that that was the case. So I'll look into that, right? Um, uh, you are Vanderweer. Wait, 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 where, where was that? You are Vanderweerden. I'm not sure what that means. I wrote master's thesis on this stuff. Well, what stuff, first of all? What was your thesis? That's it. I always like to talk to people who've done work on a, a narrow subject. Um, you always learn something when somebody mentions that. Um, but can you differentiate under the integral time, under the integral sign? Do you mean, <laughs> I'm not sure what you mean, theoretical. I'm wondering if you're being tongue in cheek. It's, I'm interpreting your, your question two ways. Can you swap differentiation with integration? And can you integrate something that is a derivative, which I think is the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? Anyway, um, not sure what you mean there. It's definitely a topic not written about well in most common texts. Please check Fallen's QFT book is really good with minimal logical jumps. Fallen's? Hey, Selvix, people do recommend books here, and I will be buying books. I think this is the new plan for the Patreon money, is I will buy the books people want to hear about, and I'll take them seriously and stream about them, and and even maybe take, maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll schedule streams so people can send in questions about the book if they want or whatever, and, and maybe we'll cover it that way. But the point is, is that um, um, uh, what I... What I'm imagining is that uh, if you do think you've got a good book that we should be addressing here, um, send me a, a more thorough link, like an Amazon link or, or something that I can actually take a snapshot of and put aside. Your, your define sigma dot t over two is something, so don't have all an exponent. Yeah, well, I, I, if you're referring to that, the vector looks off because he wrote vec slash sigma t. Yeah, okay, that's right. That, uh, but I, I can see why that would definitely be off. I get that. So that makes sense, Bose, uh, Boisenstein. But uh, was that was a bad idea, right? The the it's not like sigma t is an object that deserves a vector. E and even if he did that he should have done a longer vector, right? To cover both of them, if that's what he meant. But I don't think that's what he meant. I think you meant 
Yeah, regardless. I think he meant the vector on top of the sigma. Yes, and he didn't. Yeah, that's right. So he meant vector sigma, and uh, he put the brace in the wrong spot. That's probably exactly what happened. Although the whole thing should not be in the exponent. What's your opinion of Road? You know, Road to Reality by Penrose? I loved it. I loved that book. And it's interesting because in his preface of that book, he literally says, it's been years since I read it, but I definitely remember this. He said, if you don't understand any math, go ahead and read my book anyway. Very self-serving statement, right? Because you'll just kind of get a feel for the way this language is structured. And there's some truth to that, although it's an awful long book to get a feel for a little bit of language. And actually, I don't think he said, I, I, I can't remember how he phrased why you might get some benefit if you understand no math and you don't even like math out of that book. But if you are, if you are a physicist who has a certain body of information, what's fun about it is the road to reality, I, I think it has a lot of nice little insights. I mean, that guy, Penrose, you don't need me to tell you, he's a smart man. But he also does drop these wonderful little insights all over the place. And the places that you have no idea about, like it's very unlikely that you, he's really big into his own theory, right? In that book, he calls it twister theory. And he loves that theory. And, you know, I'm sure there are specialists out there who are big fans of twister theory. I don't uh, have much of a depth of understanding of twister theory, except for what I read from his book and some other places, a few other places. But, but um, you know, you're not gonna learn any thing brand new from that but if you are a physicist you can stretch yourself a little bit there is actually some legitimate uh, areas where you can stretch yourself and he has lots of great insights about areas that um, you already know about so I, I liked I loved Road to Reality I, I I don't see my copy obviously you guys can tell I'm next to a bookshelf here but I don't see my copy right in front of me but um, I definitely have a copy and I it's been years since I've cracked it open. Uh, probably not a bad idea to have another look at it. It's definitely something you can reread parts, parts of. Uh, Benjamin says, eh, your topology and group theory of, of the Lorentz group versus the Poincaré group is very hard to understand thoroughly. Ah, your the topology and group theory of the Lorentz group versus the Poincaré group is very hard to understand thoroughly. Okay. Penrose's book was awesome. Yeah, I'm a fan of it too. Um, <clears throat> I'm not really a physics boy, but this is still interesting. Okay, didn't, didn't, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, this this whole stream is something new, and it's kind of trying to find its footing here. So, uh, yeah, your uh, Sakurai book is incredible. I yeah, it's it's amazing. It's you know, um, I, I was starting a series briefly uh, that I, it's time to get back to, the foundations of quantum mechanics, the mathematical foundations of quantum mechanics. And in preparation for that series, I went back to Sakurai and read his first chapter. And the bottom line is this. If I can convince people what a Hilbert space is, and I can make people feel comfortable with the idea, the mathematical idea of a Hilbert space, right, which to me as a student was a major mystery. It was like mathematical formalism of the highest order. And I was like, oh, I'll never understand what that is. And I kind of got through quantum mechanics as best I could without really understanding what a Hilbert space literally was because I was so good at the mechanical work of doing the calculations. But now, of course, I do understand what a Hilbert space is and I get it. And I think if I could do, if I could teach what a Hilbert space is, getting through, I guess it's it's functional analysis is the technical name of the subject, the mathematical subject, functional analysis. Um, if I could get through that, and I think I've started down that road in those few lectures that I did, but if I can get everybody to be really happy with the abstract idea of what a Hilbert space is, then all I have to do is literally read Sakurai's um, uh, up through page if I read Sakurai up through page 57 no maybe not maybe where is it uh, 
fundamental concepts on the fundamental concepts chapter which looks like to me it goes up to the quantum dynamics chapter so basically up to page 67 right do a few of the problems then that would be it you'd be on absolute solid ground for the abstract idea of quantum mechanics and you could start speculating about all the interpretations and everything but standing on the notion of a Hilbert space I think that's the trick and that's probably you know I might just knock that one out I might just finish that up because that I, I'm motivated now to do it because um, having pulled out Sakurai always moves me to tears this guy uh, look at that even the, the beautiful red color JJ look how look, look what a good-looking guy this was look at look at his smile where's his picture look at this guy's smile come on tell me that that isn't a man that shouldn't be that that look at that that's just freaking great that's just the greatest I love this guy I love this guy I and I'm about to I'm about to I'm, I'm tearing up thinking about this I think in honor of JJ Sakurai and and this effort to teach um, quantum mechanics with some precision I'm going to uh, maybe just finish up that section and really dig into what a Hilbert space is uh, while we while I start preparing for the uh, representation theory stuff okay done <laughs> um, uh, I agree with what you're saying earlier focusing on one type of symmetry or one subject yeah you know um, although Paren remember when I say that I'm thinking of it as the old guard right Jacob he's trying to do something new here and his book is I think maybe the first the first swing at a new approach to teaching this subject and to getting it into the undergraduate space and that deserves a lot of respect right and obviously look I mean Springer's no pushover right they they published this book although I'm flabbergasted they let those latex errors get in there I do not want to see crappy latex in my Springer book I mean these books are freaking expensive and those are not subtle errors and you know it's it's not me nitpicking those are like crappy equations you would expect to see and uh, uh, I'm moving on <laughs> um, but I mean Jacob is is trying something totally different so in his case studying the subject of symmetry as a mathematical perspective is a legit idea um, so uh, uh, let, I got to keep going through it I got to keep going through it I, I just don't like um, I just don't like uh, I, I don't like he, he, he just fump, stumbles into the obvious problem it's a it's a it's an advanced mathematical concept that requires a significant amount of comfort with the foundation and just like most general relativity books, he doesn't lay that foundation, right? And uh, and he knows it. He kind of knows it, right? He knows it. But there are weird things, like like I said, you know, you do, it makes no sense to have a book that's designed at this level, where he writes the product rule in an appendix, right? Am I crazy about that? Am I crazy that that writing the product rule, having a whole appendix for the integration by parts in the product rule makes no sense right having a section in the linear algebra section for look determinants really um this is useful for the levy civita symbol right that that is a good you know showing how to define the levy civita symbol terms of terminus okay i take that one back that that's not so bad but look look at this the determinant of a and then an example for a two by two matrix and really are do we need an appendix with eigenvalues and eigenvectors it's like he's all over the map over his expectations of what a person approaching the subject would have and the point i'm trying to make is is if he's right and those appendices are useful to somebody they're not good enough to get them th get that person through this book this book is just too hard right there's no way uh, if you're like oh how does an eigenvalue work and, you, and then you go back to that and then you return to the main body of the book you're never gonna get through the book right anyway um, so so I do like the idea here you know it's just he's fall so far I feel like there's the same problems 
you know, falling into the same traps. And look, my solution for the trap is not very good either. My solution is just ramble on for hours and hours and hours about every little concept until it's all built up from zero. You could never build a undergraduate curriculum on that because it would take forever, right? So it's not like I have a real solution for this. So, uh, and that, and that's all part of it. He's wrestling with the same problem that all authors wrestle with. And um, except Sakurai, right? But then again, the reason, well, well, I take that back too. Sakurai's got, the advantage Sakurai has is he's writing a book about one thing, quantum mechanics. So he flushes out everything he needs to make quantum mechanics work. And truth be told, that first chapter, the one that I r r rail about that being so freaking poetic, right? This is pretty abstract stuff, right? When he writes this down, right? When he writes down, you know, uh, the ket operator and in and, and this particular way, eigenkets as, as base kets, that's pretty freaking abstract. And most students can't follow it. I don't think I was exceptional when I say the first time I read it, I was like, ugh, struggled. So even Sakurai's probably missed it. That's my point was that he assumes a lot out of his undergraduates. But then again, he wrote a book that he was there to teach. He could stand in front of the class and make sure they got this, right? Anyway, um, uh, let's see. Uh, let me keep going and try to finish this up. Um, uh, Pedro's book was awesome. Yes, thank, I agree with that. Benjamin talked about Sakurai's book being incredible. I agree with what you were saying with Uri about focusing. I talked about, yeah, but but you're hard to start. I'm not sure what you mean, but if you talk about my lectures as being hard to start, yeah, I agree with that. You definitely need a good book. How did you do it for Sakurai? Looking back now, the fact is you have have to be really comfortable not fully understanding things to make profit. You know, that's another, that's, God, Benjamin, that's really good point. You know, that's the whole thing with Dirac said, right, is nobody ever understands this stuff. They just kind of get comfortable with it. And I, I believe that. I believe that if you're going to teach quantum mechanics, you teach these axioms. You say, hey, look, this is the way it works, guys. There's this wave function. And the way you interpret it is... You, it's normalized to one and you integrate it appropriately and you get probabilities and that's the end of the story. Don't ask any questions. The next thing, the wave function evolves according to the Schrodinger equation. Don't ask why, that is the fact. Next, uh, we have this complementarity principle and there's like four axioms, right? The complementarity principle, correspondence principle, principle of complementarity, the Schrodinger equation and the definition of a wave function. We are now going to solve all these physics problems. Getting to those four axioms took brilliant men, you know, from 1915 or so to 1950 to figure out. And, you know, you're not, you, you know, let's start from there. And then everybody's like, okay, whatever you say, prof. And then you go through it. And then at the end of it, you're like, okay, hey, I'm pretty good with this. I learned about my partial differential equations, my potential wells in one, two, three dimensions. That's all cool. You know, I can do the WKB approximation, although I never really got that one down very well. Um, but I got my scattering stuff done. Real fun, real fun. All right, now let's go back. What, what about those axioms? What's that all about? Well, what's the, the measurement one, right? After you make a measurement, the, the wave state of the particle is in an eigenstate of the operator. That's another axiom. What a weird axiom, right? Just state them. Don't worry about the history, right? A lot of quantum mechanics books have feel like they're obliged to tell you like, oh, you know, back then in the day, they they couldn't explain the photoelectric effect and 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 oh, the Stern Gerlach experiment showed that there was, you know, you didn't have you had this sort of quantized spin thing. I wouldn't waste any time with any of that. I would just go right into, look guys, this is a math class that turns out to be perfect for physics. When you're done and you're like the calculating God and you can solve all these problems, then go back and read your history. You know, read about all the colorful people, you know, read about Heisenberg and all the freaking Nazis that he worked with <laughs> during the war or whatever, you know. Um, and you you can, and, and 
if you do that, that's taking something you're not comfortable with, which is the wave function, the Schrodinger equation, and the origin of all this stuff, and the operator, the rules about operators and all that stuff. Nobody's comfortable with that, but you would just acknowledge right up front. You don't have to be comfortable with it. You, the comfort can come later, but trust in it, lean on it, and then go back. So Benjamin, I, I, I that's right. You're, you're, you're right about that. And, and unfortunately, I think what I've read so far in Jacob's book doesn't fit in that mold. He's trying to make you comfortable with something instead of just forcing you through it and then coming back or building it up from the bottom. I think the stuff he wants to talk about, I don't think you get there unless you build it up from the bottom, right? But anyway, uh, good, very well said though, Benjamin. I, I agree with that. Um, Ilias writes, I used in my research Lippmann Schwinger equation in my research through the Green's function. Yeah, that's a great way to learn how, that's a great place to be exposed for the, the, uh, the Green's function is in Lippmann Schwinger equation. Um, Weinberg's QFT has a lot more details about the Lorentz group, spin group, topology, et cetera, than anywhere else I've looked. Um, I have his first one, and I have his third one. I don't have his second one. I probably should use some of the Patreon money to buy the quantum theory of fields, too. For some reason, I got number one and number three, but I don't have number two. Number one is good. Um, Weinberg likes to claim that his development of the subject is different than other authors. Um, it is true that in his book on supersymmetry, he uses a notation that's, he doesn't use the van der Weyden notation. He uses a different notation. And it's fun because reconciling those different notations to me is always a very edifying exercise. Sometimes it's a little too time consuming, but um, but yeah, his, but you know, his, his quantum theory of field books was, it still is pretty straightforward approach. He does the perturbation theory approach. He doesn't use propagators. I mean, he doesn't use uh, uh, the um, the action principle, the whole Feynman propagator thing. Well, I mean, oh, the whole Feynman, uh, what's the word? What's the word? I forget it. But he, he uses the straight up, uh, uh, di prop, uh, he, develops, he develops the Feynman rules from scratch through, through uh, perturbation theory. So it's actually pretty standard. But... I agree. It is still a little bit different. I mean, he definitely does. He spends time early on about the Lorentz group. That's true. I don't remember what he said about topology, but but uh, I have that book up there, too. I should probably pull that down as well. Oh, volume two. Oh, yeah, yeah. Volume two, it would be because volume two, if I remember right, was non-perturbative methods, which probably do have a lot of, of uh, stuff. Yeah. OK, Ben, I, I'm going to buy it. I'll, I'll, I'll spend some of the patreon money on that book and then if i do that my commitment is to do something like at least a live stream if not a full-on lesson about it so um Sacretry is is as you said a poetry very good book yeah i i i just love it Sakurai has a thing in there about it's like this weird little piece dropped out of of uh uh of the fourth dimension or something. He has this section in his angular momentum about the Bell inequality, which I don't think is, it's not so typically addressed, but his explain, I, I did a mini lecture on the Bell inequality and basically I just literally repeated Sakurai's work, right? I mean, I used his exposition entirely because that's the, it's just so nice. It's so good. And 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 in there, it's, it's this very hard principle of, it's not that easy, but he does a really good job. Um, eventually get to fiber bundles and gauge groups. Yeah, um, yeah I, I Bozen senior, I think you're talking about that that LaTeX thing. I think it was a mistake, right? Exactly. A missing bracket. The problem is it was it was wasn't like a hard one to see. But you know, it was kind of hard to see because they jammed it in the damn exponent, right? It would have been easy to see if it was just out there, but because it was already micro miniaturized, that was the problem. <laughs> um, uh, I've sinned in the X long expression versus E long expression. So I, yeah, that's I, I look. I I have too, right? The only the only reason I know about that is I've done it, right? No, nobody's everybody's made the same mistake. Um, I would consider the well known book by Na Nakahara about geometry, topology, and physics. Do I have that? 
No, I have one called Topology and Geometry for Physicists by Nash and Sen. So I don't have that one. Uh, um, I was very happy with Penrose Road Reality. He has been a VIP in CP complex manifolds and math physics. Yeah, you know, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta learn more about complex manifolds. Um, I mean, it's so important for. Uh, I'm, I'm. A, it's, it's not something I need to spend a lot of time on, but it's definitely something that uh, I need to get beyond the introductory level. Penrose basically said, even if you read only the text and not the math part, you will still be able to get insightful knowledge. I think that's true because he said things, he, he would always, his own insights were very well written. But it, it's, on the other hand, it's a very inefficient way to get insight. I think Penrose probably wrote other books more geared directly to that audience. Uh, yeah, reading each chat. That's actually, Sikari, you're talking about me reading each chat here. That is um, an example of inexperience. I, this is the, the most watched I've been, 43, right? The previous ones are 10, so it was easy. Um, but, you know, experienced streamers with big audiences have to handle, I, I watch them, you know, I, I, I'm, an, I'm a, a fan of a lot of streams and, um, you know, uh, they don't have the luxury of reading every chat because they have literally hundreds of people on stream. With 45, I think I can get away with it, but um, I think uh, that's not gonna last too long. Um, differentiating on inner sign, a technique widely used by Feynman to calculate. Oh yeah, the Feynman technique of integration. Gotcha, 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 gotcha. Yeah, 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 fun, fun, fun. You know, uh, I'll just recommend um, uh, a streamer since we're talking about streamers. Um, well, he's not a streamer. Uh, he, he does videos on YouTube. He probably does stream too, but um, uh, black pen, red pen. Some professor at some university, he, all he does is integrations, uh, integrals that are fun integrals, um, uh, Fourier analysis or Fourier integrations, uh, Laplace transforms, inverse Laplace trans. He just knocks them out one after another on, on YouTube and they're great. And he definitely did a few Feynman methods that are really cool. He also invented I don't know if he invented, I shouldn't say he invented. He's a big proponent of, what does he call it? He calls it the, um, he calls it the, uh, uh, oh, it, it's, it's a method of, in, of doing integration by parts. I don't know if you guys are from, remember, but integration by parts, you know, an integration technique where you have to kind of identify, you have to break your integral, your integral's got a product in it and you gotta break it up into two pieces and you gotta decide which one is gonna be integrated, which one's gonna be differentiated and then they're recombined. And, and he has a method that you can use to quickly get the answer, uh, even in circumstances where um, you end up subtracting, you, you can't finish the full integration. It's actually a very efficient, very beautiful uh, organizational technique that allows students to quickly do integration by parts. And um, what the hell did he call it? I can't remember what he called it, but it's a beautiful, but he, he, he's a big proponent of it and he does it frequently on his channel. But yeah, he does uh, the Feynman, uh, so the price you pay for Feynman's technique is I think you have to throw you have to solve a differential equation at some point in the process, right? Um, and uh, uh, I think also um, I think you use the Feynman technique to calculate some of the uh, Feynman diagrams, right? I think if I remember right, after you renormalize in a uh, second order Feynman diagram, you're 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 using the Feynman technique to solve it. Anyway, uh, the Nakahara, Benjamin, can you link me to it? Nobody's doing this. The people are mentioning books and I keep telling them to send me a link. Uh, I love good book recommendations and um, lay it on me, Ben, if you've uh, if you've got it, just hit me, hit me up with a, I don't, it's generally not polite to attach links in a streamer's chat. I know that because I've been a fan of streamers for years. But uh, 
for that purpose, I, I'm more than happy to give you permission to link a, a book. Sakurai seems like a Giga Chad. Uh, gee, Denise, I'm not sure I know what that means. Um, uh, this is the book used in all major universities. Uh, I, I presume you're talking about J.J. Sakurai. They it wasn't used in mine. Um, my the book I used for quantum mechanics was a book by a man named Leboff, L-I-B-O-F-F, -F, Introduction to Quantum Mechanics, and it's also a really good book. He he does, you know, he's he does a really good. Except now his work, I'm pulling out his book. You know the distinction between this is Leboff's book, <laughs> Introductory Quantum Mechanics by Richard Leboff. Uh, I love this book, um, but if you look at his introductory stuff, right? Um, let's let's see how he does this. Um, first of all, his 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 early review material is really good. He he lays he does a very good uh, review of of preliminary concepts look how old my book is oh my god um let me try to find the the, the table of contents here um basic concepts of quantum. so so he he feels the need to do this experiment this historical review um i th i'm pretty sure sakurai skips that Sakurai just like you know forget history forget why we got here right you don't need to be motivated this is the greatest theory that human beings have ever theorized about you don't need uh motivation right but then you see this the postulates of quantum mechanics operators eigenfunctions and eigenvalues that's the approach i love you just lay down the rules these are the postulates of quantum mechanics now these postulates i don't even know if they're well motivated by the historical section but these postulates um let's see what they are let's let's go back and see what they are uh, page 66. I, I think I remembered them, right? What did I say they were? I said they were the Schrodinger equation was a postulate. Wave function collapse was a postulate. Operators for variables leaving. Well, that's wave function collapse, right? Uh, and then the complementary principle, I think that's a big thing. So, okay, so let's see. Postulate one, right, is any self-consistently and well-defined observable such as linear momentum, there corresponds an operator that acts on the wave function. Okay, so the operator acts on a wave function, um, and then it says that measurement of A yields values which are eigenvalues of A. So the part of the postulate is, is physical things are operators, they yield eigenvalues of the operators, and uh, but it doesn't say that after a measurement, you're left in an eigenstate. I don't think that's part of this. That's probably a separate one. So then he gives some examples. So then he goes on and on and on with some examples. And then postulate two, measurement. Second postulate of quantum mechanics is measurement of an observable that yields a value of A leaves the system in the eigenstate. Yep, there it is. So that's the critical, that's the wave function collapse postulate. That's postulate two, postulate three, the third postulate establishes the existence of a state and its relevance to the properties of the system. So the state of the system at any time may be re represented by a state or wave function which is continuous and differentiable. So what's interesting about postulate three is the way he structures it is definitely wave mechanics, right? It's straight up wave mechanics. And if you look through the material, you, you'll see you know, integrals of wave functions you know, composed with operators and things like that. But what you and but what you don't see, and then like for example, postulate four, is that the time development of the wave function is given by the Schrodinger equation. Yeah, I memorized all these. But notice that Sakurai he doesn't do this. Sakurai does not jump into this wave function formalism. He goes right to the Brockett abstract formalism. So these these two approaches are different, and this approach is actually really good for an undergraduate who's good at classical mechanics and calculus because it's functions, it's integrals, it's derivatives. It's not, you don't need abstract vector spaces for this. You don't need to state that this is a member of a Hilbert space, right? The space of all these functions. Let's see, was there another postulate? Was that the last one? Um, 
Yeah, I think no, I guess that was it. I guess there's only those four postulates, right? So this book is really good. I liked I liked the uh, I'm going to leave it up. Give it give it a little bit of an honor while we finish up the stream here. So if you guys are looking for a good book on introductory quantum mechanics, I definitely recommend this. As great um uh, do you know Frederick Schuler? His lectures on YouTube and mathematical physics. I I think I've seen um, some lectures about some kind of summer school, and uh, a lot of guys on a chalkboard. I I can't really watch those chalkboard lectures very well, um, but uh, I think Schuler was was one of the authors on our catalog of space times though. Ben, the catalog of space times was Schuler not one of the authors on that? Let me. Let me let me quickly. I'm going to quickly Google it. Um, uh, uh, let me. I'm just quickly checking on Google here. F R E. Frederick. C H U L L E R. Catalog. Of space times. I feel like I feel like Schuler's name was on catalog of space times which would make him a huge hero in my book, if that's true. Checking, checking, checking. <clears throat> um, all space-times beyond Einstein, Frederick Schuller, causal structure and algebraic. Uh, oh yeah, no, I recognize this guy. Yeah, I, I, I'm looking at the, uh, I'm looking at, um, the the Google results and I recognize this guy lecturing. I, I'm sure I've seen a few of his lectures for sure. They were good. Yeah, he was, he's he's obviously a very highly experienced professor at this stuff. But no, you know, I guess he's not uh, the author of the Catalog of Space Times. Hmm. Okay. Anyway, um, please continue with the QM series. Yeah, it won't be much though, um, Perrin. I will knock it out though. Uh, Imagine writing a book about essay writing in any language and you add an appendix showing how to put letters together in the Latin alphabet. Yeah, <laughs> no kidding, right? Right, exactly, exactly, you know, or yes, it's like writing a book about poetry and including like a rhyming dictionary in the back or something. It's like, I, you know, I think if you're gonna study poetry composition a rhyming dictionary is sort of a presumed piece of equipment you already have. <laughs> I like I like uh, I like your analogy though. I think Jacob wanted to write a self-contained book for people who have math backgrounds with different notation conventions, not necessarily for learning the basics. I, you know, Alia, uh, I'm a very forgiving guy. You know, I I am not doubting that Jacob had a, a plan and an intention for all of this stuff. Um. Uh, and, and look, I haven't finished going through everything. Notation was not the issue. There was nothing in the book that he did that involved any kind of notational ambiguity that had to be clarified. There's nothing, there's no part of the subject that he covered that needs any clarification about notation. Different math background, no, I, I, I don't, if, if you're hitting this thing and you're not solid and partial differential equations. If you, you've got to be done with your quantum mechanics, electrodynamics and classical mechanics for this book to make any sense. And the bottom line is, is that uh, uh, self-contained, um, well, I, that's sort of the problem, right? Is in an effort, to, if it's going to be self-contained, it's going to have to contain more. That's sort of the argument I'm making. That's my opinion about it. But those appendices just make no sense at all. <laughs> no, and literally, literally, read it yourself, Ali, if you have a copy. The footnote or the marginal note on manifolds is essentially equal to the entire appendix that it refers to. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, Man, your stream is too fun to watch. Hope you keep doing it. Oh, I, I, I will from time to time. I'll, I'll buy. Well, I'll, I'll just buy another book. Look, look, if you guys like it, I still have twenty-eight people in the room. Jeez, um, there's not much going on. There's not much to see, right? That's sort of a problem. Uh, but now, because now I'm just talking, right? 
Um, hi, I'm from the Dominican Republic. Welcome, Junior Ren Renato Ortiz. Um, you play baseball, Junior? <laughs> that's so, that's so bad. Ortiz, Ortiz was from the Dominican Republic too, right? He got shot. It was so terrible. Oh my God, he got shot. But um, uh, welcome with the DI method. That's right, ODM. So you know what I'm talking about, the DI method. What a great method. I, I never learned that. And, you know, I learned some kind of acronym that helped you tell which one you wanted to use for the derivatives. And I don't even remember that acronym now. The DI method. That's a real winner. Uh, love BPRP. Um, sorry, phys physics. I First of all, physics. I love your name. I didn't even get it till I tried to pronounce it. And then I said it out loud. And it's freaking amazing. Awesome. Well done. Well done, physics. Well, well, well done. Um, not quite sure what you mean by BPRP. Be conceptual DI method. Yep, that's it. That's the guy. So black pen, red pen. He's out there, right? Leibniz rule of differentiating under the integral sign. <clears throat> Pi m. Uh, not sure what that means. Ah, Dover. I see. Cool publisher. Dover. Where? Oh, this book. This one underneath. This book is really amazing. It's Herman Helmholtz actually wrote a book called The Sensations of Tone. It's like an ancient book. Let's see what when was it first published. Copyright is 1954? That's weird. I find that hard to believe. No, okay. It was. If this says this book was reprinted more than 90 years after its first publication. Okay, so this is this was published in the 1800s for sure, right? Um, yeah, because he was he was lecturing in like 1847, right? I'm looking at this introduction, but the point is, is this is Helmholtz's book about music theory and the physics of music, right? The sympathetic resonance of strings, and he's got his little wave diagrams in there, and and you know he's got his little experimental apparatus that he apparently what they did is they put little pens on tun tuning forks, right? And they would swing the tuning forks around. He actually observed Lisa Zhu figures using a tuning fork. Um, let me, where is that? Where is that uh, experiment he did? He literally observed Lisa Zhu figures using like a, a candle, a tuning fork, and some other resonant tuning fork. Uh, I can't find it in here. Oh yeah, here it is. This is the apparatus he used to view these as you figures. There's an eyepiece there labeled M, and that's a tuning fork. And then from that, he could, he could take a bowed instrument, simulate resonantly vibrate at the tuning fork, and he could start seeing the, uh, he could tune to the tuning fork using these Lusajou patterns that a little, like, hot, a little uh, colored dot would make out these patterns, would move in these little patterns. Um, anyway, um, I'm so this is a Dover book. You're right. So this is a republished Dover book. But I'm, I'm going to use this for the music theory stuff that, I'm, that we're going to do. Uh, in, on the course. Oh, good. I'm glad you have the Leboff book. Where do you send book links? Just put them in the chat. Just put them in the chat, physics. Um, uh, that's the way to go. You could also, um, you could also, if you're on my Patreon page, you can send it to me that way. Um, I, I'm sort of obligated to uh, to follow the advice of the patrons um, first, just because they're so gracious as to support me and uh, I can actually use their support to buy the books you recommend. Um, what is a self-contained low prerequisite book on GR? Um, you know, I, I just don't see anything better out there than uh, Dinverno. D-I-D apostrophe I-N-V-E-R-N-O. Dinverno. I think that's, that's, there's, you know, it, it's, it's, I think that's good. That that if you're an undergraduate physicist, uh, that'll that'll definitely serve your purpose. Um, uh, Frederick Schuler's channel is now named Adita Bandari. Really? Uh, 
I think his account got hacked. Oh, maybe. Huh. Um, I have to go now, but thanks for this. Be nice to chat sometime if you'd like. I'll try to catch next stream or something. You can also find my email via archive. Uh, sure. Thanks, Ben. Thanks. No, thank you for for spending time with me. I mean, that's it's your graciousness. Um, black pen, red pen. Yeah, that guy does noob integrals, noob problems. <laughs> really? Uh, you know, he he definitely is teaching to uh, calculus students. He's mo he motivates calculus students to learn things like the DI method is basically just a way to make people totally feel comfortable with integration by parts. And I got to say, it's a big success as far as I'm concerned. That That's a great technique. I it's sort of obvious in retrospect, but all the great things are. Um, but uh, uh, um, but ever, but look, he uh, he does some pretty challenge. Meh, I don't know. I mean, there's plenty of guys out there who are who are filling that space of Hey, here's a really cool integral that, you know, let's see if you can, let's see if we can figure out how to do this. Uh, I, I like that stuff. You know, I like that stuff. Okay, anyway, guys, uh, I'm going to finish reading Physics from Symmetry. Uh, uh, and um, uh, I don't know how I'll comment back on it again, except to say that we will do the representation theory. I'll probably talk about it again in the representation theory class. And, um, uh, and then uh, we'll be all caught up. But thanks again for uh, for checking in. And uh, it's been three hours of doing this. Uh, time really flies. But this is a good book. I'm pretty happy with it. And uh, yeah, so send me the links for any of the books you would like me to get. I, I saw a few mentioned. The things I got to take note of is Spivak, uh, definitely Weinman, uh, Weinberg's Volume 2. I need to get that. And um, somebody mentioned one other book in here. I'm kind of backtracking here. Uh, uh, yeah, I feel bad. I, uh, uh, Amar Sikhar, you mentioned that uh, uh, a little bit about a double standard. I, I you know, I, I don't know what to say. I, I definitely, uh, I definitely feel like uh, this physics from symmetry book is. It's it's gonna have to turn a corner to impress me, and I gotta say the uh, the demystified books I found them all very impressive out of the bat out of the gate, so um, yeah. But you know it's just an opinion. It's just an opinion. What was the other book that somebody recommended here? Uh, it was a it was a field theory book that somebody thought was really really good. Uh, well, I'll dig it up later. Okay, bye. All right, everybody. Thank you.